of Vehicle Code Session 4. Uh, and I find him guilty of whatever offense he's charged with at that point. Can I see any of them for him? I actually like this cost of being struck. And one of the first things that is about legally the cost of being struck. And who's up there? It has a good number of bearings on this case. It depends on the circumstances. I'd hate to sign on a judge affecting me if I struck a parked car that was in front of a man's driveway. I really hate to rely on his ruling on my behalf. I mean, I'm sure he'll say something about the other fellow. I'm sure he might find something against him. But I don't think he'll find me blameless. Unless there were certain circumstances surrounding that driveway situation that would not have existed if he weren't parked there. Now, for example, if a child suddenly uh, ran out from behind his car or something, you know, and I swore to hit this car to avoid the child, or, you know, something like that, hit on a bike or whatever it would be, it's conceivable that at that point the judge would sign and say, well, if that guy was a cop, that wouldn't have happened. It's conceivable. I hate the fact. If you ever get a chance, uh, somewhere along the line of going to some of your work with other sources. If you could ever look at some law papers, maybe some of your sons are not on that already. If you ever read some law papers and read these decisions that are made, it's just amazing. You know, you'll sit there and you'll, you know, you'll sort of hold your head a while because you'll see judges are setting precedent where everybody before this judge ruled a certain way and then all of a sudden he comes along and says, oh, this day and age, that doesn't apply anymore. And then he comes up with a different decision. Or you see one judge say, yep, this guy's wrong, and that one's right, and they go up to the next court, and he turns around to see the next judge says, no, it's the other way around. And they go up to the next court, and the panel of judges uh, may rule something entirely different than the other two did, and might read it's one of the other two judges. You may send it back to the original judge. And they roll it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a good experience if you ever can, can read about some of these cases, and I have read at least a little bit about it where I can appreciate that much of an insight. Uh, uh, the lawyers, of course, that's why when you go to the lawyers and kind of you're talking about uh, what you think you want to do, uh, he might sound very pessimistic because he knows that there's been a lot of changes upon uh, this type of uh, interaction in the court. Uh, next, uh, actually you can't park on the sidewalk. Uh, let me see, I skipped E. Within 25 feet of the nearest source wall, the sideline of the street intersection of highway. Except that out. Now, in other words, they're saying that if you're going to park at any street, or you're going to park down this street somewhere, you must be at least 25 feet away from the corner. If there's no stop sign or anything. Or 
like within 50 feet of the nearest rail or railroad truck. In other words, if you're going to park your car and leave it there permanently, you mustn't be within 50 feet of a railroad truck, the nearest rail of that railroad truck. Within 25 feet of the driving entrance of any fire station, and on the side of the street opposite the entrance of any fire station, within 75 feet of that entrance. In other words, if there was a fire station here, it would be a zone that would be something like that. Now, I suppose it would be the proper angle on that way. That's what it is. It would be uh, 75 feet on the opposite side of the street, 25 feet on the same side of the street. Right. Alongside rocks of any street excavation or structure, stopping, standing, or park. Uh, sorry, stopping, standing, or park would obstruct traffic when properly signed the movement. On the roadway side, another vehicle stops or parked at the edge of a curb of the street. In other words, no double parking. On any bridge or other elevated structure on the highway or within a highway tunnel or on the pass or on the immediate approaches, there to accept where space for parking is provided. No person shall move a vehicle not lawfully under his control into any such prohibited area or away from a curb such distance as is lawful. In other words, they're saying that uh, you're not allowed to move a vehicle or control it in any way, uh, which is unlawful, basically. The establishment of no parking zone. Well, I won't go into reading that, but uh, you should be aware of this, that they can't set up no parking zone around the you know, you know that. Here's 139, 4th, 139, those are the voting Uh You may ask, well, how long can I stop? Just let somebody on or let somebody go. You already know that you're picking up a good job in the past year, not the dog that's parked. And so it says here, uh, 39, 4, 139, no operator of a vehicle shall stand or park a vehicle for a period of time longer than is necessary for the loading or unloading of passengers or materials for longer than is here and after provided. The loading or unloading of passengers shall not consume more than three minutes in an alley or at a curb adjacent to the entrance of a school, church, theater, hospital, or any other place of public assembly during the hour designated by official time. Now, I think it sounds ridiculous at some point that they spell it out three minutes. But again, they're trying to make you aware of the fact that you do have some time to pick up and discharge a passenger, but you can't sit. I have a three street. I won't read that. Uh, it does establish the fact that there are streets that are called uh, through streets where traffic has right of way over other streets. Uh, the next uh, section deals with the placement of stop or yield signs. I'm not going to read that. It just tells them where they may be placed, where they should be placed, and so on. Stopping or yielding right away before entering the intersection of the street. And then they tell you how you have to stop and yield right away. And they spell it out with regards to a stop street. This would be stop sign ordinance. And it includes the yield right away sign. I'll read it through just as a matter of uh, bringing out the point that it has to be a dead stop, not a rolling stop. No driver of vehicle or streetcar shall enter upon or cross an intersection street marked with a stop sign unless he has brought his vehicle or streetcar to a complete stop at a point within five feet of the nearest crosswalk. That's the trick part of it. 
but it didn't fly at peak wind. It was going to be pretty hot the whole uh, course of the whole course of the chat. So then five feet of the nearest course was a stop line marked upon the pavement at the near side of the intersection of the street. And Jock could see only after yielding the right of way. So all traffic on the intersection of the street was so close as to constitute an immediate hazard. Now there's the actual phrase, you see. So close as to constitute an immediate hazard. That's open to interpretation. No driver of a vehicle or streetcar shall enter upon or across an intersection street marked with a yield right of way sign without first going to a reasonable speed. And that's open to interpretation. For existing conditions of visibility. Stopping if necessary. Again, open to interpretation. And the driver shall yield the right of way to all traffic on the intersection street. Which is so close as to constitute an immediate hazard unless communicated and otherwise directed to proceed by traffic or police officer or traffic control signal as provided in section 39445 of the title, which talks about the stopping on motor vehicles at the top of the top. Now, again, let me remind you stop sign means exactly what it says stop. And uh, <coughs> it's not unusual. Uh, you know, for you to be one of those who maybe just coming to a slow roll and you figure you're going to continue on. Remember, you should practice what you preach. If you believe in stopping the stop sign, uh, you're going to teach it, you should practice it. And something you have to watch with your heart at this point anyway. If you allow your students to roll to a stop, you know, to come to a rolling stop, he's going to go faster and faster every single time. He's never going to understand what the stop sign means. Uh, I've picked up students uh, at times where, you know, the instructor said, you just hit the brake, you stop there for a split second, then you roll on. I sat there with a student, and they, you know, they just rolled the very stop sign. They were going a little faster every time. Uh, even though the instructor thought he was being, you know, being prudent in the sense that he was trying to make them aware that maybe if they stopped too long they could hit them behind. I think that he caused the students to miss the whole point. The point being that you must make a stop at a stop sign. So my own approach is I, I don't allow them to do that. I make them stop and it's a bet. They don't do it to find out because I hit that break and I kind of return to the issue. Question? Yes. When you make them if you were saying to stop at stop sign, where do you think the stop at the intersection? All right. Mm -hmm. You were deciding to stop. All right. Here's the crosswalk. We have organizers that have taken it and make it easier for you, you know. It would be the line, otherwise, an intersecting, it's an imaginary, an imaginary line that would be drawn between the sidewalk, like that. You're supposed to stop here. And I teach them to stop here. What is five feet of that crosswalk? Now, they do try to locate the stop sign in such a position that if you stop even with the stop sign, you're stopping in the right place. But you can't depend on that. Because sometimes they're improperly placed. Or they place them differently to avoid an obstruction, such as a tree or a pole that's in the place where the idealist would like to locate the stop sign. Or there may be a driveway that forces them to move into a different position, a gas wind station driver, for example. So this is where they should stop. And, uh, you know, where does the typical driver stop? He goes and stops down here. Exactly. He stops. That's why I asked. It should be five feet from your crosswalk, or not in your crosswalk. Right. But still, you can't see sometimes the, uh, the, the oncoming traffic. This is true. Nobody said that he must see from that position. But the statute says you must stop and yield right away to pedestrians and source traffic. That's the purpose of stopping. Nobody will argue the point that you may not be able to see, especially here in the city. Uh, you stop in that, in that position and you can't see. That's true. But then after you've made your legal stop and you think it's reasonably free, you stop at three blocks. 
Now, if something happens in the traffic that you suddenly see, you may have to stop here blocking that crosswalk. You may have no choice. But that's a lot different than stopping there every time you stop in the first place. I think, again, this is where drivers have been bogged down. You know, this is why I, I'm, uh, I'm practically a fanatic about this, that I think everybody should have a course that would really make them understand what the law means and why uh, it has been framed that way in the first place. Because your thinking that you brought out now reflects the type of thinking of every driver practically that you have talked to. And again, remember, you're going to be teaching students the correct way, so you're going to go home. And he's going to come back at them. He's going to say, uh, you can't see from back there. You're going to have to stop further off. And now you picture the student sitting there and he says, oh, my driver is being disturbed. I danced with a friend. Nobody else stopped with a driver is being disturbed. Not so. Maybe he's just talking to the government and found out there. And one day that kid goes out and he comes over here. He's coming to a stop at a place like Newark where he can't see around the corner. A uh, wise guy comes around the corner like that and he has a head on collision. The other guy's wrong. Oh, you know, from at the pavement, that's the point. But that accident could have been prevented if he had to have it stop and when it's close to stop. <coughs> I've never given up stopping at stop signs because more than once I brought my car to the correct stop in the legal location where it should be and somebody came around the corner just like that. I sat there and uh, with some self satisfaction, admittedly, that boy, it's a good thing I got that out of stopping in the legal place, in the correct place. And don't forget the law was framed upon recommendations by safety experts. Yeah. My experience was similar to that on the woods to you, that I'm trying to practice safe driving towards the legal road. And I came to a top street, and it was really in the middle of the big city. Uh, well, I stopped it. No, I was, as far as I could see, the traffic was clear. I could see the road up the line or into the street because the street was clear. But when I stopped, it took that three seconds, and it took the car that I had to see the top of the engine by the wrong way. Yeah, this is what made me stop the stop sign. That's what cured me. And uh, I don't know, I, I think I told you about that story way back when I was in college. Yeah. Where I did that. But that's what cured me. Uh, you do that just once, and you say, it's probably not, you know? And they've got a point. Even though, until then, the tank is kind of stupid, why not stop? Yeah, I can't see anything they can see any company. Yeah. You know, I, I know of a case where a friend of mine, who had taken the uh, driver's course, you know, I mean, he had to drive the speed, you know, and the driver said, commercial speed, told him to drive, and they told him also to stop back there. But he got a ticket. He stopped, and as he pulled out, he was a patrolman, a foot patrol, was walking. He couldn't see him when he stopped back where he was supposed to. And he creeped on out, you know, in the traffic. I mean, he got a ticket for that. <laughs> and uh, now he was a police driver for that, so he could stop, you know, effectively instead of back, you know, beyond the stop. Now, did he go to court and explain that? No, he did not. I don't think so. Uh, and yet I can understand why he would, but he should have gone to court and he should have explained it. Had he done that, it would have come up. I've seen policemen in court with this one. And I've seen the magistrate ask him, well, where were you? You know, the officer went out, well, he went to the stop sign. The first that I stopped and I came to the intersection. He was so far back, he couldn't see me stop in the legal position for a stop. And then the magistrate asked him, if he's fair minded, if he didn't say something else, but most of the time he's trying to be, I think, in that type of situation. Uh, he asked, where were you located? And could you have seen him if he stopped back from the corner? And again, the typical policeman is honest. They're always accepted, sir. And when they see they're honest, then they answer. They say, well, frankly, no. And then the judge will say, well, in view of that, don't you think that we should, uh, you know, dismiss him? And they usually do. <laughs> and if he doesn't want to, uh, he, if he says it's up to you, Your Honor, for the judge, he believes that the person is right anyway. But we're going to let you know this time. We'll let you out this time. Uh, you're right, that can happen. It happened to me. I, I stopped and had a, and it was my own hometown, and that policeman pulled me to the side afterwards and said, Hey, you went to a stop sign. I told him, Well, he had stopped. You know, he argued the point. I knew he was close, but he couldn't argue with it. 
to allow him to drive and show that he had a vehicle which had properly equipped to deal with his specific position. They uh, indicate that they would have that pasted on the windshield. They have a movement afoot now where people are saying everybody should have his license uh, showing at the windshield anyway. Some people think if this were done in my help, especially if they were a picture, they have some love there, though. Uh, but the concept has been brought out at uh, certain safety council meetings, which I've attended. I know they're pressing very hard at that point now. Uh, The next page uh, regulations of traffic and parking on state property. I don't believe that. Cooperation bulletin board on the continue on past all that. Penalties is something that we should be aware of because it's sort of a catch all type of order. On page 206, 39, article 39, 4 dash. 215. Uh, penalty, many persons fail to obey the directions of a police officer or fail to obey the directional signals for the signs provided here on this shall be subject to a fine of not more than $100 and a privilege of 10 days of jail or both. In other words, they're telling you the maximum sentence. They can fine you up for that. For not obeying the instructions that are on the signs or indicated by someone waiting to be in search of a police officer. Uh, they go into the enforcement offices. They talk about the judicial powers of the director. He does have the powers that are actually conferred upon a magistrate, as they explain here. And uh, this is why uh, you, if you're having a license revoked, may be advised to the director's office to show cause if they come down for a hearing. You know. And you have the option of appearing there if you wish to to uh, explain to him what your circumstances are. Yeah. So is there in front of one gentleman or a panel or what? This is the director. You're acting like a judge. Okay. And there's one person? One person. In other words, let's say, the way they usually do it, let's say you've accumulated more than 12 points uh, within a three-year period. And you get a letter from the director. You just come down to the on such and such a date to show a course why you like it. So when they're in the media, the judge is. And then uh, if you have a good statement to make, uh, as any judge, as any reasonable judge, to use the legal language, as any reasonable judge would, he'd say, well, under the circumstances, we'll let you have your license. However, the next violation you get. Or you might say, I'm sorry, I don't agree with you. I don't think that what you're saying justifies us allowing you to continue to have the privilege to drive. Your license is not suspended for a period of 30 days. Or you might say, you know, it's revoked for at least three months. Or, you know, he will determine uh, your sentence at that point, determine whatever the contact is about. Uh, They're talking about the process of issuing a complaint. I don't think that's necessary for us to go through. Uh, the performance of ministerial acts, uh, this is something, if you know legal language and you understand what it meant by a ministerial act, uh, they're just uh, spelling out that certain people are doing certain functions, that uh, a ministerial act is where they are uh, serving in the capacity of a uh, uh, an implement of the state, and they can't be held personally, or personally liable because they're serving their correct ministerial function. In other words, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. In other words, let's say uh, uh, a policeman or an inspector writes a summons or something, or let's say uh, somebody even sends you a you know, notice that your license is going to be revoked, and they confuse you with somebody else. And you go down to Trenton and you prove that it wasn't you, it was somebody else. Uh, this person cannot be sued by it. He performed a ministerial function. Somebody uh, gave him the wrong information, you know, that sort of thing. The other one can be sued in the state right now, the director or I think the attorney general is supposed to. Uh, 
again the next day, they're not going to believe too much of this, although uh, uh, the point uh, that you made uh, back in the last excuse is not having a name unless you're the first name. Uh, maybe you should remind me of the name of your friend. Well, yeah, I One night, Dennis made this point, and it's right here again, that uh, an arrest without warrant, uh, they come out and, uh, you know, they give you a summons instead of arrest you. The summons, the purpose of the summons is to uh, make it more convenient for you. Instead of taking you in and saying, now you're going to have to wait for the magistrate until he comes, you can't leave, you're going to have to put on, or what have you. Uh, we're going to uh, give you a summons, you can appear at such and such a date in court, you can give your advice. That's all that spells out, Title 39, 5, verse 25. I won't read for this uh, I think technically you're supposed to exhibit your license to the magistrate. In fact, people show up in court, you watch the magistrate says, you have a license, let me see. From the first thing you get. Uh, I will go through the suspension and revocation and that sort of thing. Uh, they do tell you the fine. It's on page 209. Uh, I do want to remind you, though, uh, I want to remind you that a magistrate is the one who takes your license from you. A policeman can't say, just let to leave your license. I mean, you can do it, but legally you can't. He can take you into court, the judge can say, I have his recommendation, it's just for that to leave your license, I'm going to take it from you. Uh, once it's taken, the only one who can restore the license to you is the director of the motor vehicle. Only the director can give it back to you. That judge can't say, I'm going to take the license, you're going to give it back in two weeks, and I'll give it to you in two weeks. You have to get it back from the director. Once he takes your license, he nails it in the trim. Mm -hmm. Trim and nails it. Chapter 12. Now, chapter 12 
deals with drugs. I think that you might be making mistakes and you might be doing 
and his natural strength. The direction may make such rules may be reasonable for the time of the driver. That talks a lot of power. Talks a lot of power. And right now, this power has put us in a position where the director has said, way back, not the one that's in power now, the director has said that you can't become a driving instructor and that you can't
people go around and work on the experiment and they go out and they, they come back and they, you know, in the back of the fry and start to shot at the home and they're trying to do what you know. It goes on every business. And it's a real problem in this business because the source of the factor uh, leaves openings for other things to happen that are beyond the control of the guards who want to the state authorities. And so by that by virtue of that they do have the right to tell you we want the government to what? Who are you giving the election to? We want your feet stated on the air. So that if somebody is running around and saying, I'm giving you a discount for $10 and one of your instructors, you're going to find it out and catch it. So who's your penalty then? No. You as a private school owner can be charged with being the contributor to the thing. If you happen to set up any, again, the word reasonable comes into play, reasonable values to make it less likely to happen. Like any other business, you own a business, you're the source. There's something going on in your business that you have taken no measures to do something about it. And they have reason to believe that you might have known it was going on, or you should have known it was going on. That's not a phrase that's supposed to be used now. You're in trouble. That's true of any business. You could be in a barbershop and you're off the guy in your barbershop and take numbers and you don't know it. Uh, they might say, You should have known it was. And next thing you know, they're on your side. But the same thing here. Uh, if something is going on like that, well, you should be alert enough to know what's going on. And again, they're reasonable. They know that you can't know everything. If you establish reasonable guidelines for the people working for you, and they tell you how to accomplish by the steps that they're doing, then uh, it's less likely that this type of thing will go on. But again, where there's a will, there's a way. I think people work out some ingenious systems of some sort. Definitions, again, they tell you what a driving school is, they go through the Title 39 rule, but again, notice right away, on page 3, they tell you right away about fraudulent practices against us. And they, they bring that out for a good reason. Now they go on to give you all the definitions, they talk about what they represent, a principal place of business. And they tell you, principal place of business, location designated by the applicant, who's the by the director. This is another thing I don't know. What's that? Your place of business, wherever you think they're better enough to get a local ordinance, the city ordinance, uh, county ordinance, and now the city has to tell you where you can be located and how you can be located? Right. They do that, yes, we do it. For what reason? Not to be close to another school? Oh, they, uh, yeah, doing it, not so much to keep the right motor school. I know it's right next door, but they don't care about it. Private school is distinct from private qualifications. Well, that I agree to that. But, to that extent, but the way that you have to notify them, and it, it seems like everything you uh, really read, ever since I read this book, I'm uh, really, I wouldn't want to go to school. Uh, I have my own school. <laughs> because everything you do, you got to uh, get those to that, you got to let them know everything you do. Right. It's uh, ridiculous. Right. You can't run a history enterprise that way. It's not ridiculous, but let's put it this way. Perhaps the goal was done in some way. But I don't, I don't think some of the things you're complaining about are not reasonable. I think that the state has a right to let to tell you that they should know where your business is. Before they had these rules in class, there was a time they were much more loosely than this. When I first went into business, for example, all you needed was a telephone and a car. And I hate to admit it, but this is the way I started. I had a telephone in my house, and I had my car outside dual control. And then they passed these rules after that. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, some people start going to it, they give an address. It's not the wrong address. Somebody's address. It wasn't even the wrong address. The inspector would come around and he'd find out where's the driving school. Where's the driving school? Where's that? Oh, we went to the town. You know, they couldn't even find the driving school. But I think it's reasonable for the state to say, look, buddy, you're in business. You have to tell us where you are. And we have to approve your establishment. There's a reason we can't tell you you've got to have it. I can go fancy or tell them. But we can tell you that we want you to have a look, and that it should be a place of business, that it's obviously a place of business rather than all. And after having had the business of my own, I don't mind telling you that it's for your better benefit because I put the house in house a couple of about three years back, and then I can tell you I put a lot of interest in doing nothing for business in house. You don't want a business in house anyway, but they're expensive. And it's not impossible to run a business out of town. And the law is going to be to separate the food with all the methods of 
extremely likely if you go to the if you go to the market of Don Colbert, you got to stop me and you have to go to the river, it's pretty cold right now, right? You have a family over on the river, it's pretty cold right now. And that's what it is, what kind of weird, weird hours of the night. I've had cold and 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 cold and
instructive life today. Please say goodbye. Thank you for your training. I go to Buffalo. I don't drive. I don't know. He can do it. There's a thing we can do. And we train another man who can do it again. And then a person to drive us to Buffalo. And uh, yeah. tell the man to sell for life. We have a price. Sure, we have a price. And you're telling us that we're an unstable group. You're telling us that driving schools don't have the stability they should. You're telling us that people come into it on a fly by night basis. Should they come into it on a fly by night basis? Because they can go out and get a school license immediately with an instructor's license, practically, once they've got their instructor's license, they can have a whole driving school. And then you say, go ahead and do it. And they've never even taught a lesson in their lives, and you're going to let them open a school. And then you wonder why their school is a half, you know what? I, I agree with that. I was looking into that. Do you like in the ball? What's wrong with the driving school? I don't know how to get serious. This guy's in the business of the business. He's still running this school of operation. I haven't shown you guys it's been a business longer than I have. 15 years. They got one car and they're still out there pounding away the way they did 15 years ago. First, the man sitting there in the car smoking a cigar, blowing smoke around, looking around the window. The other one reading the newspaper. The other one, whoa, 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 banging on the side of the car and the yeah, doing it. Getting paid for it. But this man went out and he opened a driving school just like that. He got an instructor's license. Then he went out and said, Goodbye, Charlie. He opened the driving school. That's what they said. He was doing the thing. He was doing another school that I didn't do the thing. But he went out and said, That this man's running a school today. And if the inspectors had their way, they'd probably close it down tomorrow. But it's their fault. Their regulations made it possible for the man to enter the prison at half hours of that. And run a good shot operation and run anything but professional practice. So, this is why I keep telling you that you should try to get the experience with the driving school. Now, first of all, you're going to know what you're doing. And then, second, when you know what you're doing and you go out and open the school, you're going to realize the wisdom of having a past regulation which makes people put in the time in the field properly apprenticed in this stuff. You know, a big author is going to run a good school and do good school to those driving school for us. So you can tell me quite honestly, what, what kind of things do you think driving schools have in general? Good, bad, or what? Do you think that they're, they're something so outstanding as a group? No, they don't. This is unusual. And again, uh, you're probably right in most instances. And again, the reason this has happened is because of the wrong types of regulations. And yet, what they've got is good, but they haven't regulated the right thing. They're still saying that a 21 year old kid, all right, well, that was, uh, I was that age, I got a voice back to my old man, 21 year old kid, <laughs> has a private license, three years, he's out of high school, who gets a job with me as a driving instructor. As soon as he has his license, he can write in and say, I want to open my driving school and he goes out and does it. Vehicle Code, Session 5. In a way, it was, uh, it was somewhat critical. And of course, uh, I have to apologize for getting a little bit off on tangent because you know me, I, I, I tend to, uh, it can be a good trade, it can be a bad trade, but I tend to uh, go on and say exactly what I believe. I tend to call down whatever I feel should be corrected, and I hope that I've tried to uh, stand back and allow those who wish to call me down, where they think that I stand correction, uh, to feel free to do the same. Because this is all part of learning, this is all part of improving, and this is the only way progress can go. By people being ready and willing to honestly reevaluate uh, whatever it is they're talking about, in this case it happens to be traffic laws, uh, specifically rules and regulations that come out of the traffic laws, given, which give the director of motor vehicles the authority to govern us as driving school instructors and driving school owners. Uh, today I'd like to just try to avoid being critical, uh, because we do have before us somewhat of a time schedule. My goal is to get all of you in here prepared within the next few sessions. You know, we've got a total of 10 sessions. I want to do as much before that. I'll say only two sessions, hopefully, at the most more. Two Thursday night sessions and two Tuesday night sessions. You know? I want to 
want to get to the point where you're going to be able to pass an instructor's exam, or be so close to being able to pass it that it'll take simply minor pressure. And you'll apply for a position, and if he's still in the position where uh, the regulations find him so that he can't hire you until you pass the state instructor's exam, you could make him aware that you're ready for it, you're trained for it, and you'd like to give it a try as soon as possible. But again, I have to, in order to get this to that point, I have to watch out that I don't get around criticizing them. And people will have to watch out that we don't go up on that tangent because uh, it's a lot of fun to really pull these things apart. And we're going to continue on with that at the later stage of the course. But right now, we have to accept this, whether we like it or not, or agree with it or not, is beside the point. Uh, we have to accept what we have here and recognize what it is. The instrument that is used to govern driving instructors and driving along. On page one, they have a list of the uh, table of contents. Uh, they explain to you what the definitions are. Our goal tonight is to go through this section by section to help you all to understand what is involved in terms of first owning a driving school, helping the second to know the rules and regulations that you have to know in order to be able to pass the state instructor's exam and to function properly out of the field as a driving instructor. And then finally, time permitting, if not tonight, the next section and the one after that, I'll be doing, as I said I would, uh, the type of thing that, uh, again, you need in order to really be uh, prepared for that test. I'll be taking the driver's manual itself and taking sections out of that that I know are very critical and uh, quite important in terms of an instructor's exam and your ability to pass it, and of course, again, your ability to operate as an instructor. Now, notice again that they do define uh, what a driving school is. Uh, we went through that last time, so I don't think there's any point in going through that again. Uh, is there anybody that wants me to review it? Anyone here? All right, thank you. Uh, just in passing, you must again realize that a person who intends to open a driving school uh, must have his place of business approved by the director. They point that out as part of their definition set up here. Uh, notice this telephone answering service on page four. They explain that you may use an answering service, but they point out to you that the answering service cannot be used as a branch office. And uh, that it shall not be advertised unless it happens to be the same location of the driving school. Uh, and you're not allowed to use them as your office personnel only. They can be supplementary personnel, but they must not be your only office personnel. Uh, then they go on with the licensing. And they tell you that every person proposing to engage in the business of construction in a driving school shall be licensed by the director. And then they go on to say that a license will not be issued until at least one instructor has secured an instructor's license. And at least one motor vehicle has been approved for driving school use. And then they say a license either initial or renewal will not be issued until compliance with these conditions has been as an effect. Now, it will go on somewhere here to tell you about the expiration date. I just tell you this now. Every instructor's license and every driving school license expires at the end of each year, December 31st. Regardless of when you purchase it, regardless of when you uh, pass the test and pay your fee for the license. For example, if you went down and passed the instructor's exam tomorrow, and you paid your $15 fee for passing the instructor's exam, and you know they're giving you the license, uh, you would be in a position where this license will have to be removed again for another $15 by the end of this year. Uh, you know, again, we can't get into the hassle and debate over the chair and why they leave that up. Uh, it's done. I'm not saying that I agree with everything, and we, we will feel that we have to agree, but you have to know what they expect of you now. When your time comes and you're in the field, as I said before, and maybe you along with enough, enough of us who have been in the field for years uh, can speak out at the right time and at the right way and get some things. 
in this process, you just mentioned a few moments ago, is it a few words? In other words, what, how could you do this? Man wanted to open the And uh, for what reason? Now, Paul the Lord, he must be worshipped or employed by someone who has it. He's like, oh, he has it, he's employed by him, but he's not employed by him. But he's ready to see him. You'll see that someone's first has like this book and one that I'm worshipping. How do you go about getting it? Well, they hold various license, et cetera, so he's ready to go. Forward, uh, right. Look at it this way. Here's what they do. You have to pass the state instruction exam. In order to do that, as you already know, if you've read the East Door, the parents of our students, uh, you must be hired by a guardian, or you must be endorsed by a guardian so long as he said he would be willing to hire you. And that's the proper way to get an endorsement for these times. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into whether this is right or wrong. All I can tell you is that from the logical standpoint, I can understand what happened. And their goal was to start doing eventually the type of thing that we're hoping they're going to do, where they see to it that only people go into the field who have any kind of training or experience to know what they're doing as a matter of protecting the public and ensuring even that person of being a success in the business. Unfortunately, it never worked out that way because it was too loose. It was too loose, as I told you before, because all you have to do is go to somebody who hired you as a driving instructor, get your instructor's license, and then you may apply for a driving school. Now, if you can put an application, that like going to driving school. And they send you the paperwork and everything. You have an instructor's license, you do all the other qualifications, and you're in business, you know. Uh, I've told you before, the disadvantage of that is that the typical person who went into the university with that probably won't train. And you know better today, you know, the people in front of them who are today in the house and the students of the United States to get into that background of the instructor who calls for the wrong method. And background in terms of even just running a business, you never even learned how to run a business. There are no business qualifications. Of course, you know, the free enterprise system so that they fix it. But as I said, we won't go too much into the detail of that. But now, if you wanted to open a driving school, you have to get an instructor's license. Now, you would go to somebody who hired you, and it would involve you doing one of two things. Either being closed now, but not answering it when he asks you about whether you would intend to open your own school and when, uh, which is a common question for a knowledgeable employer to ask, but many of my knowledge and I just hired you. Uh, or the other alternative is to lie to them. Oh, sure, I want to work for you, and then later on say, change my mind, you know. Uh, you take this, but I've seen both methods here. I've seen people tell the truth and say, look, uh, I'm not going to kid you. First chance I get, I'd like to go out and open my own school. And that's when other people say, oh, no, not me. I've never, I don't want to go into business and after that. I think of the fact that my wife, like I said, like, I'm going to get his license, you know, and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going into business, right, bye bye. I haven't had to, I guess I've had a problem with that. Other employers have had more of a problem with it than I've had. Uh, but I've seen people do this, you know, where they uh, enter the field that way. Uh, I can't counsel you on that, but I can make you aware that you must have an endorsement from a driving school in order to get your license, your instructor's license. And what you do after that is your business. And uh, I advise you, the other thing I can advise you to do is to be discreet and uh, try to apply the basic principles of what they call the golden rule, and if you don't do it to the person who's hired for something that you wouldn't have done to you, if you do, you take for it a thousand ways. And of course, these men who have done it, they're afraid to hire anybody, but they're afraid they're going to be wrong as they will. They will hire them. Uh, I say, if you give a man a fair shake, uh, if he's got any sense, he knows that everybody comes into the field to, to go into business eventually. Everybody's got free enterprise in the back of his mind, that's the key to our society. I've never hired a man who, uh, you know, I felt really didn't have that objective somewhere in his mind. Uh, oh, yeah, some people say, well, I don't, and they, I listen to them, they really don't. But I've hired men who said, certainly, someday I'd like to open a school. Uh, and that's why I want to work for you, because I feel that uh, I want to learn how to uh, be a good instructor, or at least be an instructor, and then I want to get out and open my own school when I can get paid. And uh, my position was fine. If you do that in a fair way to me, you'll leave with my blessing. I'll say, you know, good luck and that sort of thing when the time comes. But if you leave, if you call a dirty stump, I'm going to say, I'm here today and going tomorrow, I'll do everything in my power. 
who work against you if I have anything to do with it. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. But that's me. Other people don't talk that way. And they, they don't level with the people they're hiring, so the people they're hiring don't level with that. Actually, they try to level with your employer. And let him know that in the back of your mind, you probably would like to open a driving school someday, but you really don't know when. And you don't, really. Uh, you have to find out a lot about the business. Uh, yeah. That's really That's a thought theory. One vehicle being approved. What is that for Right, right. That's a good point because later on you'll read something on that. You know that you have to have your vehicle properly registered. As you continue reading on, you'll find you have to have insured for a minimum of uh, 50, 30, uh, 50, 300. I want to say again, 50, 100, and 300. And uh, uh, part of this is going to uh, be the type of thing that determines whether or not they approve your vehicle for school use. You will get a second registration if you want to call it that. They call it a school identification certificate. Uh, this identification certificate will describe your vehicle. And it will say on it that you have your vehicle equipped with dual control and properly insured. They usually will send an inspector down to see all of this for themselves. Most of the information they get when you send in your application, you state your insurance company number, and they check with the insurance company directly to find out if you actually have the, the coverage required. Okay, uh, so, uh, going through here now, the license is required. They tell you for whom to make your application. Uh, they tell you that the application must be signed and sworn. And it is a sworn statement. Uh, I've been surprised at the leniency shown by the Division of Motor Vehicles to people who I found out later had actually misrepresented themselves on the application. Uh, you know, I think I've indicated some of this to you before, where a man comes in and says, you know, uh, he had a good driving record, you know, and, and then they come along and say he had a revocation. In fact, he had three revocations. He's still on hiring. Uh, so if they do, then he's going to have to come up before us for a hearing. So at that point, my answer is no. You know, that's not the way I understood it. Uh, I've seen other people who had a lot of traffic coming. Again, they didn't put down, and they figured, oh, nobody knew about it. They were about one ticket away from losing their license under the point system. And again, I didn't know it. Uh, and I found out in one case that the inspector, where you know, actually he didn't answer honestly on the application. They could have taken it and tried it before, you know, given them a criminal record, you know, messed them up. But they did. Uh, again, it's a matter of realizing that people uh, sometimes don't understand the implications of what they're putting down on a piece of paper like that when they answer a questionnaire. They think it's just my application or, you know, the employer's application. I'm realizing fully that the state form is kind of this uh, To make sure that when you make this application when you find something, everything you put down there is true. To the best of your knowledge. If you're not sure, then indicate that. And they tell you that they want the applications uh, accompanied by uh, certain documents. So they're talking about the uh, driving school at the start. You have to indicate if it's a corporation, a certified certificate, a copy of the corporation, uh, a copy of the corporate resolution, and so on and so forth, uh, engaging the school to operate on the business. They will want a sample of every, of each and every, this is page five, samples of each and every record of agreement to be used by the school. Sample number three, of all forms of receipts to be used by the school. They have to do that. They have to have that on the file. 
When you change your form, you have to send a notification of the change. Uh, a schedule of all services to be formed by the, to be performed by the school. Uh, what does that mean? In other words, you indicate that here is what we're going to do. We're going to construct on an hourly basis. Uh, our fees will be at this point, and they're always subject to change. We understand that. And you state the fee. We're going to give lessons. We're going to take people to road tests. We will take people to river tests. We will give refreshers courses to individuals who wish to, where they have a drive. Uh, we will uh, provide for six hours of classroom and hands on curriculum. Uh, and there'll be more on that later on. Then they tell you the next thing you want to do is make sure that uh, you submit three photographs. Now, there are two things, three things you have to submit. Photographs, three photographs, and this would be passport type. The application for an instructor type, which you get from the driving school owner who claims to hire you. And then you get a fingerprint form, uh, which again, the driving school owner should give you. Because you send the print and an ad for them, they give it to them. Uh, the fingerprint form is going to uh, be used by the FCO, your local police headquarters for that, by the way. It's going to be used by the state authorities, the state officials, to check uh, quickly into your uh, motor vehicle record, the possibility of any criminal record, and anything else that they feel that they can put their uh, finger on that they might decide makes you undesirable, as well as positions that they might feel make you desirable. If you've held certain positions, certain jobs, they think of you there, and you have a good record there, naturally this is something that helps you, the good that comes out to the fingerprint. Uh, then it is also sent to the FBI headquarters in Washington, and this has been one of the most painful snags they had over the years, waiting for the report to come in from the FBI, which is not. And I've seen them have men wait, men who, you know, who I believe have very good records, men who were police officers. And who wanted to drive and stuff to my heart. And I figured, you know, God, if anybody is clean, they should be clean. Well, you never know. And, you know, the state and I got, you know, we're waiting for the FBI, and then they get the report to this town, we're waiting for another report which meant that there was something wrong. Uh, but I was, what? They made it something small. Maybe that one, they wore on the army, got it, something like that. Uh, maybe it was something else. Uh, so it's that type of protection tool they give you. This is a good thing about it. This is a good thing about uh, the way they handle this type of thing, because it puts you in a position when you're a driving school owner, where at least you feel that uh, somebody is checking these people to a completely and thoroughly as they should. You certainly can. If they choose to say, well, this fellow should be hired anyway, even though we know they robbed the bank ten years ago, you know, that's their business, but you're not saying. Uh, in fact, you don't even know the guy off the bank or something, you know. Or if they choose to say this fellow and a wall in the military, and that has no bearing on this type of thing, so it doesn't make any difference. Well, they're saying it's not you. And it puts you in a strong position as a driving school owner to that extent. Uh, they, I think that this is the wisest thing that I've seen them do. The unwise thing about it is that it's rigged on the process. That's the All right, so your fingerprinting. Uh, will be part of that. The license fee for a driving school license, the fee is $15. I guess you would have to know what the, what the fee is. I'm sorry, the driving school fee is $50. Right? <laughs> it's the instructor's license for $15. Uh, the instructor's license. Now, you, as the driving instructor, are the one who is obligated to pay the fee. Uh, just as you pay the fee for your own driver's license, you know, $3 fee, $4 fee, is today, I guess, an annual license. You are the one who has to pay the instructor's license fee. You don't pay the fee, however, until you pass the instructor's exam. 
And then, of course, they tell you part B of that, uh, the license is valid for the calendar year. That's all. And uh, it's not as clear as it should be in a sense, but what they're telling you is that at the end of this year, if you got the instructor's license today, you'd have to pay another $15 to renew your license for next year. And same thing with the driving school. If you just opened the driving school today, you'd pay $50, and then you'd pay $50 again at the end of the year to renew your license. Uh, notice that they, number three, display of license. The original license is to be conspicuously displayed in the licensee's principal place of business. And you should be aware of that, that if you don't have the license hanging around the wall in your place of business, you are not operating as well. Uh, naturally, the license is not transferable, as is indicated in part four. As they indicate, where uh, it's a sale of uh, more than 25% of the capital stock of the corporation. Uh, you know, let's take an example. I suddenly decide I'm going to uh, sell stock of my corporation you know, to the family or something. Uh, more than 25% of the I have to file for all the licenses. Uh, notice the next one. Uh, again, you should realize how carefully this is regulated. The director must be notified in writing immediately of the event that arrangements are made for the disposal of the business or a change of interest. And then, of course, they point out that the director may, in his discretion, permit continuance of the business by the license. The pending processing of the application made by the person to whom the business or interest share is concerned. Uh, and they go on with the other details. They tell you what to do in the event you have a so, loss. Yeah. The important thing here is you can send notices where you can render all the licenses and all the instructors fit. Does that mean that the uh, instructor then has to apply for new license? That means that part of your processing is that you have to get new instructors license for everybody. Well, I just let them just send on. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, well, that's why many driving schools, that's why very few driving schools are sold. Uh, and when uh, you're in business, you rarely change over from one form to the other. The smart thing is to decide before you go into business what you want to do. Incorporate or run as a proprietorship. If you plan to let it grow, you should right away start out of a corporation, a title, what anybody tells you. I look into uh, a lawyer who said I didn't have to, and I shouldn't, but he was right in one sense, except that. He was wrong to the extent that he gave me a lot of heartache when I went to make a changeover. And uh, these people are suspicious anyway when they change. Why are you suddenly incorporated? And they start scratching their head and wondering what you're doing, why, you know. Uh, uh, they, they start to wonder. They start running around asking everybody questions. You know, have you done anything with this, that, and the other? You know, you get that sort of thing. You wait till you're in the business, you see. Uh, it's enough to get you annoyed at them. Plus, they're doing the job. But the main thing that you have to do is you have to do something. You maintain 75 percent. You never change over more than 25 percent. Now, uh, another thing too. Now with this uh, surrendering of licenses, by the way, any time that you're going to change over. Uh, or any time that a person leaves your employment, you must surrender his license. But now. What I did when I came from a proprietorship to a corporation myself was I came along and I said, I'm going to wait till the end of the year. And that's the way I did it. I timed everything. And I said, now, the proprietorship of Fairborn Driving School is closing down and it's going to become a new driving school. This is what I said in effect. In the form of the corporate party of Fairborn Driving School Incorporated. And, you know, then I had to get new instructor licenses which were issued to Fairborn Driving School Incorporated. But I had to renew everything anyway. In fact, they'll advise you to do that. The state people will tell you, wait till the end of the year and do all that. I say you're better off doing this in the beginning. If you know you want to incorporate, do it right away. Take over. 
to give you a certain amount of protection. Yeah. It pays anyway, because you pay an uncorporate tax anyway in business as well as a corporate tax. So you might as well do it in the uncorporate tax. That's yeah. right. So go right on through it. Well, either way, corporate or uncorporate, you still pay a tax. Right, but the purpose of uh, doing that is not necessarily to circumvent any tax. For example, no, the, 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 the accountant was the one who was in the picture and he yeah. said that some corporate get a certain pay financially and so on and so forth, uh, paying a small business tax and working well and that sort of thing. And frankly, I think it's less. I was looking at the legal implications, you know. Uh, I mean, I brought a dog to take my house away. They wreck a car for me, they kill somebody. I mentioned you know, the other guy, he's driving school and the guy that owns the proprietor, and he's not even my taxes for the war. Uh, but a corporation has a measure of protection and can fold up to the bank. It's not quite that simple, though, as the lawyer explained to me. Uh, that's why I didn't incorporate any earlier than I did. The lawyer said, well, he said, that may be true, he said, but if you're a one man corporation, and that's what you use in the front, they call it a sub chapter F. If you're a one-man corporation, basically, and you're the president of the corporation, they can still sue you, the president of the corporation, anyway, even though you file bankruptcy and so on. But it does give you a measure of protection due to a puppet. You said that uh, president of the You can... Well, if you were president at the time, something happened, I don't know that you would get away with something. That's not the but that's true of any business. If you're any business, you know, if Bob is dropping the bus full of down and you want to sue, you don't get the same thing. It doesn't matter what kind of business you're running. You still have a guy who walks in and he's good. You know, very good guy, you don't want to sue. The only thing you have to do is watch if you have insurance. That's not a just a couple of years. And if you have a, a, an income which is high enough in property of any kind, then you try to protect it in whatever way you can by additional insurance. Okay, then the, uh, uh, they go into the uh, uh, loss of life and so on and so forth. Location of business, part B on page six. And here's something you should know with regard to the business. You should know that you cannot run your office or a branch office within one, uh, 1,500 feet of a building in which the motor vehicle registration and driver's licenses are issued to the public. Or within 1,500 feet of a building where any part of the driver's license examination is being conducted. Or the location where driver's tests are being conducted. Now this is a kind of a far reaching statement because uh, in some areas where the test is out the street, you know, it's kind of silly. Over in Dover, for example, they're out the street in Dover. And uh, there are other communities around here. I think Orange Town is another one where they go out into the street. Plainfield, I know they take them out into the street. Uh, so this is a kind of a poorly worded clause here, and yet it, it's intended to mean basically that where there's a building, an establishment of the Division of Motor Vehicles dealing with licensing and application and that sort of thing and tests, of course, you're not allowed to have your building within 1500 feet of it. If you go there, you can test it. I was just down to the board the other day, you know, on the Fifth Avenue, they have to do the right way. And uh, right next the door, the same building, it was just empty. They got on the door, block out, driving too much fast. Now, they must get away with about 1,500 feet of car. That's right. <laughs> I, you know, I can't stop because they're right in the same building. Right. That's a good point. That deals with my, my question. Because these motor vehicle agents, which are really franchise operations, change with the change of government. That's true. And when you get a new governor in, he gives the franchise their credit. And then they open up a new thing. Suppose they open up one. Right. They're not going to front anyway. Right. Well, this is, this is what may have happened with that one. He may have been there before that agency was located there. That's the question. In that case, they really can't make a move. In fact, the Division of Motor Vehicles is the one you can have to answer for it because they should have seen to it that this agency was located there. Uh, I, I would have a hunch that uh, what happened there and where the agency came in was a lot of them changed around when uh, Cato came in. Right. That's right. Okay. They always change what time you get to live in the gym and the gym. Well, they all have to go Okay. Uh, we'll move on. Uh, I don't think I have to 
read the part about the acceptance of the rules of the story. Uh, Dr. Richard, the obvious, uh, how they can't uh, cause the discontinuance of a school which was already there. Uh, they said before January 1st, 1962, which was one of these regulations. Uh, 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 what they really are saying, though, is that where the driving school was there first, you know, this is not going to apply to school. I assume you have to uh, get new license and change location, too. Yep. Yeah. Uh, no, wait a minute. Wait, let me step back on that. Sorry. You don't renew your license. You advise them of your change of address, and they send you a new license to replace the one you had, but you don't necessarily say the state. Oh, really? Right. You can change the location. You don't do that in Barbara. Uh, here they, they don't make you pay the fee. You do pay the fee if you close down on the yoke. That's the that's that they, they have to come and uh, check it all out again. Well, they do that too. They'll come down and check it all out and they say it's currently the fee. So like people move from them. one place to the other. They don't charge any fee. Mm -hmm. Change of address. They don't charge any fee. Our location is prohibited. They tell you that you can't conduct a school from a business. Uh, you can't con uh, conduct a school rather from a house, a trailer, a tent, a temporary stand, a temporary possession, a room or rooms in a hotel, or to the exclusive facility of a telephone answering service. No. Uh, I got news for them because I know at least one school that used the hotel system. Uh, so something special. And again, it may have been, this may have happened before these came out. And uh, actually, this is conducted from a house. It's a ridiculous statement here because. You say, I can show you dentistry, real estate, I can show you almost any occupation coming out of a house. This is, this uh, is ridiculous. Uh, they do clarify it at some point along the way, uh, as I've read this through, and there is a point where they explain that uh, it may not, it may be in a house. You can run a business right now in your house, provided you have a portion of that house which is exclusively devoted to non-residential use. In other words, let's say you decide to hold down the stairs the driver's seat. Right. There's nothing that they can say. Yes, there is. Uh, I can. Uh, uh, there's 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 Gene was telling me last night that he wanted to buy a house right. that had a garage that was connected to the house by a breezeway, a last breezeway. And that he was going to take the garage, it was in a zone uh, business district. He was going to take the garage and turn it into a driving school. And they turned it down on the basis that it was physically connected to the house. Well, but, but that may be local. That's no, not the driver. Oh, well, I don't know. I can't say what it is. There has to be more to it. Well, there has to be more to it than what he told you. Because I know okay. people who have been in business who had an office location and decided they wanted to consolidate. And move the office from the place of business into the house, the exact opposite of what I did. That's all. Mm -hmm. So that's how the office is all day when you get out there, right in the house, and give you just one room if you want. Uh, I've seen people within the past couple of years say, I'm buying a house, and I'm going to run the driving school in the big front porch in the front of my house. And I'll meet all the other requirements. Two bathrooms, so on and so forth, classroom facility, what have you, as part of my office space. And uh, when you come over to school, they've done it, they approve it. Well, the chief said that he was told that he should appeal that decision. Yeah. They could be, they just turned him down. Well, it depends on why they turned him down. It depends on what the story is. If a person said, uh, uh, let's go this way, if the person would have to go from that place into a place of residence, to go to the bathroom, for example, that would be grounds for denial of the application. I think that might be what's behind that. I don't think they turned it down. It's, 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 it's a good point. It's a good point. It's a good and it's a good point because they may be getting even tighter on the regulations than I am. It's very possible they're really putting the screws on and tightening them down, whatever their reasons may be. And they might be coming more rigid in their interpretation of any of this. They have to realize that the people who are in power are not the ones who wrote this. Uh, and they don't understand in some instances the original intent of this. And if they understand it, they may not agree with it. They might say, well, maybe so, maybe they've allowed a lot of people to get through with this before, but let's stop it now because this is what the regulations say. 
And this is what they should be. And they're going to draw the line. This is what might be happening. I can see that that's a very good possibility of what's going on. Uh, office space requirements. Now, they tell you that if you're going to have an office, a place of business, uh, must have at least 150 square feet of office space. It's not as big a space as it's not. You know, 10 by 15 rooms. Right. 10 by 15 would be very small to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, then they tell you about the principal hours of business. They tell you about the time requirements, by the way. Uh, and they tell you that you may have a sign. They're not saying you must have a sign. Too often people misinterpret the word may to mean must. They're saying that if you want to have a sign, it must meet these requirements. And they tell you about that. They tell you that the sign must be, you know, readable at least 100 feet away. And what that blood is uh, not less than five inches high. And the name of the drawing is still fine. And of course, what they don't tell you is that uh, something that you should find out on your own that it doesn't violate any zoning ordinances in the area that you're putting in the sign. Uh, business hours, and this is a real tricky one because, you know, it's, it's, it's where they're regulating, you don't know how far they have a legal right to go. The principal place of business or branch office of a driver's school must be open to the public for service for at least six consecutive hours each regular working day, except for a one-hour lunch period. Now, that's the way they work. Yes. Now, they're saying that somebody has to be in that office six hours a day at least. Uh, truthfully, I guess most schools don't really abide by that for the moment. Uh, I think they have people in their... Uh, uh, some days they may have them in there six to eight hours, and other days they may not. Uh, tri uh, uh, strictly from the technical standpoint, uh, you're supposed to have them in there every single day, five days a week, at least. Uh, again, you know, something that you have to say you're going to do, they'll ask you to have a schedule. It'll tell you right here, the hours during which such facilities are open to the public for a service must be filed with and approved by the director and prominently displayed on the front door or front window of the license principal place of business and or branch office of the Except that B, where you got to let them know, is what I just explained. Well, again, I know how you feel. I can't do it. I know how you feel because I think this is the way everybody who had owned the driving school for years reacted to it. So, you know, who does say And, uh, well, they have their reasons, and, and everyone, uh, those of us who are in the field, you have to realize when these regulations came out, we said, okay, what's going on? What's the politics going on here? Because that's the way we looked at it. And they said, ultimately, oh, that guy kind of got tired of the door. And, and uh, you know, so you should have seen people fighting, and uh, they're just lucky that. As I said before, they've got a lot of small people running small schools. Because if they have people of the caliber of Taggart in the business, they know you're with them. So they may come with that thing very fast. You get more people in the know what they're talking about, on the phrase of battle, you know. This is know what their rights and responsibilities are on, what their rights and responsibilities are. Right. People are. Things have to change, you know. But in the meantime, this is the law. Until somebody can test it. Like anything else. All right, the branch offices, they tell you that if you're going to open a branch office, you have to have it approved and uh, uh, it has to have a copy of the license in the branch office. And they send you a copy to have a branch office and it works. They do send you a copy. You don't pay another $50. You just open the branch and you put your license in. Oh, you got to wait a second. That's odd. You say half the price, but no branch office. No, you don't pay anything. Not yet, anyway. I don't say it's too loud, it's like driving a parent. Well, I'd rather pay you half the price and tell, than solicit you to be at number six. <laughs> I tell you, I'd rather, I'd rather not pay that to be in the first place. To be at number six, I don't worry about it. <laughs> I think when it comes to a showdown, there's a limit to how they can really regulate your business. They can regulate you in a reasonable way. If that proves to be an unreasonable regulation, you will never stand. And this is really what they have to think about. Is it reasonable? 
and it's unreasonable to try to abide by it. You, you owe everybody, including yourself. Uh, certainly, a sincere desire. You have to show at least a sincere desire to abide by the intent of the spirit of the regulation. And where there's a distraction of the letter of the rules and regulations, then the question has to come up as to how reasonable it is to expect people to abide by the letter of these rules. Especially since they are only regulations and they're not the law. Which again is not the case. And even if it were the law, it would answer this question. All right, the, uh, the record should be maintained. Changes in the directors of offices, I won't read. Uh, I'm not going to read the grand jury, that's and that sort of thing. But the records should be maintained. These are important. <clears throat> These are important because even as a driving instructor, but you're not an owner of a school, you should have this in the back of your mind. You know, it hasn't been working for me. And in spite of going through this type of thing with them as I'm doing with you, it certainly hasn't been as long a session as these will have been, but you know, we won't, we didn't meet for 15 sessions, two and a half hours or so at a time. Uh, we met for someone less than that. And uh, it's understandable that they overlook it, but I, I make strong points of this type of thing. Uh, I tell them things are required of me. And yet, when I come along and say, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, and they ask myself, what do you think we do? You ought to come along and tell me that, and if I got to do that, then it's a waste of my time, and, you know. Let me leave me alone and go off my back. And I have to pull this off and say, look, buddy, either you do this or they're going to take your license away from you. All I do is tell the state inspector that you won't cooperate with me in abiding by the driving school regulations and it's far by license to you. In fact, if I don't sign up to these regulations, I say, go ahead, I wink and let you go. And they find out about it and they say, try by driving school license. And then you're out of a job and I'm out of business. And I have to get that strong with people because they don't listen to this part of it. And they don't realize that the driving school owner is in a very, a very tight position when he's dealing with inspectors when it comes to these rules, if they choose to make an issue of being too lax about enforcing these rules and regulations among your own employees. When you're working for yourself, you can get away with a lot, maybe, as a lot of these fellows do, because they have nobody to answer to but themselves and the inspector. And they can say, you know, a lot of things, lots of times with the authority, a small business name. But when you got people working for you, they don't show you an awful lot of sympathy. As soon as you get employees, you're a different breed of cat in their eyes. And you have better be running your business according to the way things are supposed to be, or they're going to find out why, and make you understand why. Okay, then. So the types of entries and corrections. And they tell you what they want. They say first, A, and this is part E on page 8, and then A under that. Every licensee shall maintain the following records in a business-like manner, with all entries to be made in ink. Corrections shall be made by drawing a single line through the error and making a new entry. Only standard abbreviations are to be used. And then when it doesn't come to the driving instructors, you get the girls who hire in the office, so you have to put this thing in front of them and say, look, see, here it is. Now, it's got to be done this way, not because it's my way, but it's because it's their way. It's their way, it's what they want. It's not necessarily just what I want. You have to really get people to see that, because, you know, we all live in a world where we've learned the, in, in our society to say, well, you know, people don't have to act like they're great dictators, you know, they can tell me I've got to do this. I have to listen to them 100%, even if they are divorced, and I can do it out, you know, that sort of thing. We all get a little bit like that at one time or another. But again, this is a different situation. These are things. That number with respect to every person given us lecture, tutoring of any kind or any other services related to the instruction and the operation of motor vehicles or motorcycles. You've got to have a record. Let me see your book. Two, a book, or, a book or other approved record showing the date, the type, and duration of all lectures, lecture, tutoring, instruction, or other services relating to instruction in the operation of motor vehicles or motorcycles, including the name of the instructor, giving such lessons and or instruction. And they mean it. They want these records. They'll hold you down if you don't have them. And if you're a driving instructor and the board says, look, 
What did Jesus do for that? Ask him out. He's not being a pain to you. He's trying to find out because he's got the report. And, you know, uh, what did you do? Left turn? Right turn? Stop? What did you do? I have to know. How long did the lesson last? Was it an hour? Was it two hours? I have to know. Again, he knows, but, you know, let's say uh, you went overtime, you've got to find out what you did. Was it an hour lesson? Was it a half hour lesson? An hour and a half? What was it? Uh, okay. Yeah, sir. Uh, do they come and check out? Check it? Monthly? You check it? Not monthly, but they come around. Uh, about every half a year. Every six months. Not, not on schedule. Uh, they have their own schedule. It varies. In other words, they, you don't know. What they'll do is they'll give you a call. They'll say, uh, they'll get on the phone and they'll say, uh, by the way, uh, Mr. Jones, uh, we're ready to come out and inspect your record come Saturday. One o'clock will be at your school. And then there you are, you have better be ready. Uh, you can say, well, I can't be ready. Once in a while, you know, you might be in a position where you have to say that. I'm going on vacation, I'm not going to be here. That can be the case. Uh, or the fact that that happened while I was on vacation, the girl said, we can't, we don't know what to do because he's not here. So they waited until I get back and then we uh, prepared and we had the inspectors come in. Now we called them back got together with them, and again, they usually just take the day. They say, well, we'll just take the all right, that day will be all right. And then they come in, and they look over the record. They're not out to close you down when they come around, very truthfully. They're not really there to do you any harm. They're there to see to us, though, that you are making an honest attempt to abide by the rules and regulations. And that's because being one driving to a woman's grave, as far as life is very not to me, but to somebody else in my house, Oh, we haven't done that in years, you know. Next thing, out. They came around and started checking all of the checks and all of the rest of them. They were out of the You know, there was just a couple running the drive. They worked hard and nice couple. Uh, but they were put out of business just like that. Again, it's the intent. You know, they didn't even intend to keep up the rest. It was obvious because they, had, they were back then. I didn't put it in they said they hadn't done it for at least, so they said for years, and then they said, well, maybe it's only been about eight months or so, whatever it was, and the inspectors walked in the door and they found it out and they nailed it. But what is it today to find out who was that lesson for what, for how much, and for what time? It's not to their advantage. It's I mean, their advantage to keep the record. I mean, what do they want to know for? Well, they have lots of reasons to want to know. I'm just saying, for your advantage, uh, many reasons. Suppose the student calls up and says, you know, look, I went to this driving school. And this guy took me out for a half hour left and made me pay for an hour. And he didn't even teach me anything. I just drove around the block and that was it. We drove a little bit here, a little bit there, and I was back home. That was the end of my life. Now, if you're required to keep records, then somebody's got to start justifying the two stories, you know. And they might come in and look at your record, they can at least look and see if you're doing something along those lines. They can even they might have the name with them. Only you won't know it. They won't have that slip of paper. These fellows are smart. They'll memorize the name and come down there and they'll look in the contract book. And this is what they've done. I've seen them do it. Pull out this person's contract. Pull out some cards and everything related to the person. All these people. This sort of thing. And then you start thinking and you pull everything out and have it there for you. Again, if you've been unethical and you're handling with somebody, it may not show. You know, then if the person basically is honest, they can cover things up anyway. But you're on the spot. If you're an honest person, you have nothing to fear because, again, everything uh, is as it should be. He sees that something doesn't jive up in it. Uh, he has to decide whether you're lying, if he's exaggerating, if he's exaggerating, whether the student is or not. And then he pulls back, and at least he knows everything's checked out. So at least he can records that show that you did something. Now, if a person chooses to make a case of it and says, look, I can prove it, I have witnesses, they told me to come in at a certain time, then you're in real trouble. But as I say, if you're keeping records, you're in a position where you can pretty well substantiate what you're doing. And again, if an instructor is doing his job properly, he helps you to substantiate what he has done. Again, for his protection as well as yours. Because if he's the one that's pulling the money out there, it's only a matter of time that they really were able to investigate that piece, and they really do. But if they want to go home in on something, and they want to find out who's going to close the school down to drop that instructor, they'll come in there and they're going to find out who it is, and it's really somebody. 
and the tool that holds the tool can be struck and they'll get rid of him. Unless the tool be struck with whom is with the only with the knowledge of the tool only, or through the only skill of it, so he's not even making an attempt to keep things in mind. So that's why they do it. I mean, they're not doing it to make life miserable for you. They're doing it to no, no, I, guard against those who may be taking advantage of those circumstances out there. You'll see when you get to one of the driving schools, when you're driving the truck, how can I do You go out there, you are in your own little world. You have to realize, you go out there, there's nobody looking over your shoulder, there's no force in the at this end of the room. Pretend that you and Jacob was to look at you and watch you and see what you're doing and see if you're moving on or anything. He's not within ears, but he can't hear you get nasty with a customer on the phone. He hears nothing. Nobody is nice as long as you and the person in the car. And it's their world versus your world as to what really went on. And uh, I know when I get a discrepancy, uh, I always say there are three sorts. You know, I try to listen to both sides and figure out what the truth really is, because each one stretches the tail. So they see it the same way. Sure, they don't jump to a conclusion. But if every time they turn around, they're getting complaints about your driving skills, and it turns out that the particular instructor in that school just falls right into a pattern, and it's only a matter of time until they home in on it and do something about it if they feel they should. It depends upon the type of complaint. If somebody, if they get into a pattern of complaints, they say, this guy is too rough an instructor. He's kind of rough. He's making me go into traffic. I don't want him to go. He's forcing me to go. You know, they'll say, who are you? I'm you. That's no complaint. But if every time a student calls in and says to them, you know, maybe about five or six different students call me in every so often, you know, God, I don't get my full hour. I sign up for an hour less and I end up with 35, 40 minutes. And then they start to look at it. And then they're going to start to see where they can narrow it down to whether it's an instructor or a school owner. So they have reasons for what they're doing. There's methods to their madness. And they say, well, these guys are nuts. What are they doing this for? They got good reasons. The longer you're in the business, when your time comes, the better you'll understand why. And uh, I tell you, it's only the past, I say the past two years or so, my eyes really have opened up so that I saw why a lot of this, what I thought was nonsense for you. It seems like nonsense if you're an honest person. When you come in contact with dishonest people, then you understand why. Then you realize what it's all about. If you're honest, the employees are honest, no problem. Okay, then. The uh, <coughs> next thing that you have to do, number three on page nine, you must have a file containing the original contract entered into between the driver's school and every person receiving lessons, lectures, tutoring, instructions, and other service relating to instruction in the operating motor vehicles or motorcycles. You must have a file of contract. The whole contract. You said it's just words no longer use the contract? No. What I said was we don't call them contracts. I checked with them and asked if I could use the word enrollment form rather than contract, which is frightening to the general public. And they agreed. And so our contract on the top doesn't say contract, it says enrollment form. We have found that the students don't get uptight as much as they used to, and they still get uptight. I'm not going to sign anything, you know, that's a lot of people in this. But we use the word enrollment form. Again, with their approval. I didn't just do it and say, okay, we're going to do it now. I checked with them, I said, here's the form we'd like to use. We encounter people who are so afraid of the word contract that they won't sign anything, and you want us to have people sign before we get lucky. So please consider this approach. And they said, okay. Yeah. Um, do we need to check the field from the top? People have to get to the top side of the field. Do they turn it around to use this stuff out? Do they make it extra difficult to try to do work? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It works. Right. It works. Right. The only thing is you have to watch out. Something like this especially, you've got to be careful that you get them to realize that there's an agreement being entered into you. Uh, you have to watch out that you don't get them to feel that they just say, well, he misled me. He didn't tell me I was signing a contract and I'm back. See? Uh, again, you know, this is what you have to watch for here. Yeah, right. Now, we tell them that, uh, you know, there's an enrollment form, and then we tell them the conditions of the enrollment form. We say, you know, then we do tell them this, but there's a type of contract. And then we tell them about the manager and the trust about it. And so it tells you, all contracts shall be consecutively numbered so as to agree with the permanent book of registry and shall contain the following. And then they tell you what it must contain the name and address of the school. Uh, and then notice they tell you that all contracts shall contain the following statements. 
And you know, uh, I've had uh, you know students question us about why we do things on our contract form. And here it is one of them. It says, this constitutes the entire agreement between the school and the student. And no verbal statements or promises will be recognized. Now, you put that phrase in there and somebody reads it and says, boy, you pay you more than done, you know? But it's not, it's not our phrase, you see. They told us, you must do this. And so we put it in there. Whatever their reasons are, we put it in there. Uh, I don't like the phrase because it would make me suspicious if I was signing something. But as I say, we do it because they say so. They tell you to put down the length of lessons, the length of each lesson, which must be in units of not less than a half hour each. Stay as follows. One half hour shall mean one half hour of actual instruction. Or one hour lesson shall mean one hour of actual instruction. Again, your contract or enrollment form, you may choose the clause, has to be worded in that way. The type of car on which the instruction is to be given. <coughs> Showing clearly whether the students in short and car equipped with automatic transmission, fluid drive, and standard manual gear shift. And that means whether or not an additional charge is to be made for the use of the school vehicle. And if so, the fee therefore. Now, this is a weak point, by the way. They tell you whether or not an additional charge is to be made for the use of the school vehicle because they're making it sound like. There's nothing wrong with teaching people in their own cars if you choose them. And my position is that uh, this is a kind of unfortunate thing. Because the worst thing to do is to teach somebody in their own car and find that for some reason, due to some quirk, you won't be properly covered by your own company. Especially if you don't have school control of that car because they issued this and I have an insurance agent tell me this because they issued your policy with the understanding that you were going to limit your instruction to the use of dual control cars. Otherwise, they wouldn't have handed you the policy. So, you know, again, you have to watch out for that bit uh, about uh, taking people out of their own cars anyway. Uh, the one accident I had is driving a school instructor was with somebody in their own car without a dual control. The person had a driver's license. And the person we got back to something, and you know, something they had to come this way back, and we had an accident. And after my accident, something way down the road. Well, you get a few shots of the street, you ultimately can be held responsible if somebody wants to really work on it enough. The fee charge for each lesson. If fees are charged for an individual lesson and or the fee for the entire series of lessons agreed upon. In other words, you've got to say how much they're going to pay. And again, you might say, why? You know, it's none of their business. They say it is our business. Because if somebody says, you charge them $14 for a one-hour lesson, you gave them only a half hour, we want to find out about it. If they're paying $14 and you're saying you're going to get one hour, you better give them an hour, and your contract better say it, and you better be honest in trying to abide by your contract. That's really what it's for. It protects the public. And frankly, to turn it around, it does protect you. Because... Uh, a lot of people will take their agreements that you kind of like to do, right? So, uh, you know, uh, and when it's down on paper like that, they tend to realize that they have obligations just as you have obligations. For example, one of the biggest problems in the industry is that it's a rainy day and somebody goes up and says, I don't believe that I would benefit by taking lessons today because it's raining. Yeah, we've had that, you know. And uh, it's funny when only one person does it. But if you've got a reputation that you let people get away with that, you'll have a very short chance of all that. You'll have men standing around with their hands in their pockets. Men who are going to be dissatisfied with you. But let's say it's worth their dissatisfaction because you think that there's a safety hazard involved. The fact of the matter is, the best time for somebody to be out there driving an automobile for the first time in the rain is with you in a dual controlled car. With you, the person who knows how to advise them as to how to handle that car more safely when it rains or storms, even if they come out with help. And there are extremes, you know, there are extreme conditions where we will make the call and say, Mr. Smith or Mr. Jones, we will not give you a lesson today before. And they usually size the loop of things crazy, and I'm glad to hear some of that sort of thing. Uh, we don't like to go out where we feel that we're engaging ourselves. We have to realize that if you've got a problem with that too, you have risks that are there, which can be amplified by the weather. But again, you can get into problems where people don't know their obligations. 
Uh, the file shall maintain containing a copy of the receipt for any money to pay for the driver's school by a student. The receipt form shall contain the license name of the school, the name of the student, the date of payment, the amount of payment, the signature of the student, the signature of the person receiving the payment, and the receipt. Are you free? When you're driving the instructor, you go and give a lesson. You collect money from the student, whether it's a check or a cash, you're collecting the money. And the state says, and it doesn't say if it's a check, you don't have to do this, by the way. The state regulations say now that when you collect money, you give them a receipt. You sign the receipt, you say, here you are, Mr. Brown, you sign the receipt for me. And you tear it off and give me a copy. And again, now, this is, a, this is the one I've had to really struggle with on the instructor's notice. In fact, it, it, it was such that I had to send out letters to students. Because I had students say, uh, uh, here, I'm giving you a receipt, uh, here's a check, I'm paying you my check, so let's not waste my time. Here's where you're at. And uh, again, I've had to send out letters telling people, you know, when you take your lessons, after all, state regulations mandate that we give receipts for all money collected. And you must sign the receipt, and the instructor must sign the receipt. The receipt. This is not my idea, it's not the school, it's the state that's mandated. So please abide by it. Uh, when you're in business, when your time comes, it's something you might think about, something that should be done. If your students are not properly informed, they can foul up the work for you. And they can get your instructors fouled up, you know? And I had one man, he was, uh, he was with me for years, and I didn't realize what was going on. Uh, he would be collecting money and not getting the receipt. And uh, the way I happened to find it out was that I went out there and I took over the student for one lesson. And he said, here you are, here's the check. I said, okay, thank you, let me, let me write out the receipt. He said, oh, I don't need a receipt. And why not? Well, the other fellow can write it out because I paid by check. I don't need a receipt. And then I had to take the point, please sign the receipt after three hours, so on and so forth. And I had to get on the guy, and oh, he didn't have to do all. Why? Why do I have to do it? And then I had to get the book and shove it under his nose and say, look, there's many, this is why you have to do it. You're lucky you didn't get put out of business. You're lucky you don't lose your license. So, Again, when your turn comes and you're told to do something with a driving instructor, do it, even if you don't like it and don't agree with it. And when you're a school owner, same thing. Do as you're told with the regulations, and then you can always try to get them changed later on when you think something's unreasonable. The signing of the receipt by the student and the instructor, I can tell you from my own experience, is going to be the salvation of your business when you own a driving school because they'll see you blind without it. Even with it, they can find ways to get around this practice. And it's going to be the salvation of your high as an individual driving instructor because if somebody wants to accuse you of something with regard to fees they pay, and you're in the habit of giving a receipt, and everybody questions about it, but you would never leave me without giving a receipt, you're in good shape. Yes? That's <coughs> up here. They're saying that all contracts shall contain the following. A file of main county maintains contain a copy of the receipt. That's under what must be on the contract. Unfortunately, they're editing and they're all the information <laughs> on this is poor. You're right. Uh, and in the next page, it is something that should be on the contract. Right. right. The way they put it, it sounds like it should be on the contract. Actually, it's a separate part. That should be five. That should be five. Yeah. Uh, that probably was a typist making a mistake or the main organizer didn't need these. Didn't need these. Uh, that's good. Uh, a statement indicating that the regulations of the Division of Motor Vehicles concerning driver schools are available on the school premises for examination by the students. In other words, you have to tell people. Uh, you have to tell people that. Uh, uh, your regulations are available. You must have them hanging up on the wall in your office. All right, the uh, lost mutilation of destruction of records, I won't go through that. Uh, the retention of records, they tell you all records must be maintained for a period of three years. And uh, I've had them tell me, uh, you know, better even more than that, five years, uh, keeping for five years. I've told them 
and keep it for seven for a while. I read record I ever had in the school, and I finally got there, and I couldn't keep it anymore, so I thought it thrown out. Did you have to keep it for seven years for the 10-11? Uh, I don't know. I thought it was uh, five years for that memory. How yeah, many years? Three years. Three years. And they changed it to five. Because when I found it, I just thought it was five. It's less than seven. Yeah, I didn't think it was seven. Yeah, I thought it was seven. 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 I think it's only five, but I'm only guessing. I really don't know. I don't know what it is. Uh, three years is what I always thought it was. It is, though. So like, internal revenue is not the record. Internal revenue is your profit loss segments and your income tax return. Yeah, but you can set the, you, you can prove your record, uh, what you write in your other books, even with these records. Yeah, that can be done, but it's not necessarily all required. Uh, the identification certificate, this is what they're talking about. They're telling me about the e uh, You went down the identification certificate to the second registration given by the inspector. So, by the inspector for uh, Specifically by the Office of the Chief Inspector. <coughs> and, uh, let's see. <coughs> They'll tell you that you must apply for this uh, on the prescribed form, and that's the uh, They'll tell you that it, uh, it will not be issued unless and until uh, the vehicle is equipped with rules and sold. Uh, number one, they tell you that the source they talk about is foot brake and clutch. A dual wheel is not required, a dual gas pedal is not required. Uh, the licensing of the tools has filed with direct evidence of liability insurance, and they tell you. That it must be uh, at least, they say, $100,000 for bodily injury or death, $300,000 for accident or bodily injury, and that sort of thing. That's uh, $50,000 due to destruction of property. So it's 50, 100, 300. You should know this. This is something you'll be expected to know. Something you want out there. Uh, the driver's school shall furnish evidence of uh, such insurance coverage, coverage and it's got to be on their form. Now watch out for that. Uh, I never forget where the insurance company, uh, my insurance agent didn't understand it when I first went into business. You know, when I went to renew my license that year, he said, oh, here's our form which states that you have, that you have the coverage. You know, and I sent it in. And boy, they sent me a snappy letter right back. Boom, oh, just like that. Unless you get it in on this form which we sent you, your license will be revoked as of such and such a day, you know. And uh, they made it pretty strong. We can do it our way, you're out of business. And so I went down to the agent and said, here, look, come on. Now fill out the form they want you to fill out. They filled it out, and, you know, oh, a lot of, well, it's a lot of what you do. We get it, we sent it in. You must use their form. They want to use their form, and they won't accept anything else. The way they do it. And then the, uh, uh, they're telling you about what happens in the event of cancellation, that sort of thing. Uh, they do tell you that, uh, that uh, they shall stipulate, and this is for your protection, that your insurance may not be canceled except upon 10 days prior notice. And this is why they make them fill out their form, by the way. It's very ridiculous to sound. Their form says, that the insurance company knows and understands this, that they can't cancel your policy with at least, without at least 10 days notice to you. So it's not, you know, it's not all as bad as it sounds. You know, a lot of people say, God, they're bothering us, look what they're doing, I have to use their form, you know, but they have good reasons for it. Uh, number three, uh, such vehicles equipped with seat belts for both the students and instructors, that's at the bottom of page 11. And then it says, the seat belts shall be used by both the students and instructor when the vehicle is being operated for instruction purposes. Now, this was made in the days, this was made up in the days when you didn't have to show the harness. The seat belts were just starting to come up. Yes. They don't say anything about the headrest. Again, and we talked about that several times. Again, this was before the state of Texas. This was before Texas. Are they required now? They are, let me put it this way, while the driving school regulations do not specifically require them yet because they have not yet been revised, 
uh, it would be very unwise for you not to use any safety equipment that you have on your automobile. Again, if you have safety equipment and your business is safe and you're a safety expert when you're driving a truck and that's what you are, when you're driving a school and that's what you are, uh, you're in a very weak position if it ever comes to a showdown and you have to end up in a court defending your position. If somebody says, prove to me that you aren't negligent. How can you prove you weren't negligent if you didn't even tell your instructor that they had to wear harnesses and they refused to wear the harnesses and the seat belt and adjust the headrest? You know, prove to me that you weren't being negligent. I say you're negligent. I say you're an expert, you should have known this, and you should have told your people that they should wear these three portions for the protection of their suit. I say you lose your shirt. You will always have to prove that you are negligent. You don't have to prove that you weren't. Oh, let's put it this way. They'll prove it. In other words, the question is, did you tell your instructor to do this? I send out a board. I've got it in writing. It's in writing. All instructions. You must use this safety equipment. If it's in the automobile, you must use it. And if you don't, uh, you know, if they know that if they don't do it, it's their problem. I don't put that way in writing. I don't say, you don't get yourself up. I don't give them the alternative. I say, you must do this. And if they choose the alternative and something happens, going to be more there hard to mind, but that's what I check on. You see, again, if you're running a business, you're supposed to check on the people working for you. And, you know, I've walked up to many a man, you know, he's getting ready to pull his car. Where's your shoulder hop? Oh, <laughs> I never wear the thing, you know. What do you mean you don't wear the thing? You're an expert, you're talking about safety, you're teaching people to drive, you're telling them to do the things of drive, and you don't wear it? That's like a minister saying, don't do drinking, smoking, and all that sort of thing. And then he goes out and does it, he gets drunk, and that's going to be you put on your equipment. That would be a dream if you had when you came into the field. You're going to practice what you preach. Otherwise, you get out of the field. And again, if you're a driving school owner, you're not doing that with your people in as nice a way as you can, you know, without roughing them up too much, then you're the ghost. You're not able. Okay, then. Uh, they do tell you that they must be used, as you can see, the top of page 12. Uh, part two at the top of page 12, a sign displayed on vehicles. Vehicles while being used for driving instructions must have this place conspicuously there on the sign. With background and letters of contrasting colors. Stating student driving. The sign must be visible both front and rear. And letters not less than three inches in height. Letters may be of a reflectorized material basic white, amber, or yellow color. Now they say they may be a reflectorized material. They're not saying that they have to be. The conduct of driver schools, then they go into the advertising. They tell you that you can't even advertise without having your advertising approved by that. Uh, so I'll hear about it. Well, that's what you're saying. You can't read. I was told that you cannot advertise your race. Is that correct? I'm sorry. I know. I'm going to choose that. Okay. Well, officially, you could not read. Advertise the race. 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 There's nothing in here that says you can't. There's nothing here that says you cannot show your race. You make the draw. Huh? You make the draw. Yeah. I would want to. You put the TV out of the box. Everybody just says you just did here. Yeah. I wouldn't want to advertise my race. First of all, it's cheaper to your school. I wouldn't want to advertise race. Yeah. Uh. I say going on, but they're telling you what you can do, the phrases you may use, so uh, we can go past that and set that in the uh, They tell you that you can't use the word state except as they tell you to. And they tell you where it may be used. It's part four on page 12. It says the driver's school may use on forms, contracts, and assessment or the advertising for an advertising matter. The phrase, this school is licensed by the state of New Jersey. And that's the only way you're allowed to use the word state if they tell you. Uh, the next page, number seven, they tell you that a driver's school shall not solicit business of 
for the business to be solicited in its behalf or display the city on the advertising material within 1,500 feet of these buildings in which motor vehicle registrations or licenses the drivers the motor vehicles are are issued to the public or within 1,500 feet of location where the driving test or driver's license are stopped. Now, again, as an instructor, you might be in an awkward spot. I've been down to the test here and I've had people walk up to me and say, uh, uh, what do you rate? How much do you charge for lessons? Uh, well, you're not soliciting business. And yet, you should be very careful about how you answer them. My own approach has been a very, a very broad approach. I've always said, well, I really don't want to quote the rate here because uh, I don't want to lead into too much of a conversation about the driving school and I'm close to, but I can give you my card and you can call the driving school and ask. Uh, again, you can answer the question if you wish, I guess, and there's nothing wrong with it. Somebody asks you first about, you know, what the rate, but then the next thing, you know, they say, they, oh, uh, by the way, and what do you start the road trip and uh, will you pick me up in such and such a place? Next thing you know, you're engaged in a conversation with your God for business right there. And then, again, when an inspector happens to be by you and hear you, and you never know how he would decide to react to it. You know, we use the term inspector time and time again. Now, are any of the guys who get the road test and these things considered to be inspectors as far as this goes? All the men getting the road test are inspectors. Are they the same inspectors that come by and check your records? Uh, frequently they are. But it's the same group, you know, with these other inspectors. That's changing, by the way. They are moving to uh, civilian inspectors now. And uh, uh, this is a whole new area that they're going into. They're moving into civilian inspectors, and uh, these inspectors are gradually going to be... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, the inspector then is a state police officer. He is a... a a special type of police officer, right? Yeah. Well, he's a special police officer for the state, and specifically, he's actually part of the director's own police. Is that the same thing as the guys in the uh, inspection the division? Right. But they're not the same, really. Uh, those are different. Those are motor vehicle inspectors who have specific responsibilities with regard to inspecting motor vehicles. They're not the same type of person. But they can issue citations on the street. So yes, they uh, can. But uh, they are still not exactly the same category as the other inspectors are. The other inspectors are really, they're really tough. All right, the question is this. When are you going to start applications for such a job? What's that? When are you going to start for applications for that particular job to be specific to inspectors to check on the school? Uh, <laughs> 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 I'll be a little lenient, huh? <laughs> they, uh, well, they, they have, uh, I think you can only apply for that job. They always open. They, they don't pay enough. Oh, they no, are. I mean, I want to be specifically for that one thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, if I, had, if I had something to do with it, I'd like to be in a position where, you know, I have to be devoid of driving school connections, of course. But I'd like to be in a position up there where, uh, somebody uh, who has let me help them to do things the way I feel they should be done and in that experience in the field uh, because there, there's a lot to be done yet. They, they're trying mostly hard to do something and yet they, they really, you see the simple inspector never owned a driving school and uh, he hasn't been a driving instructor or it's been so long since he's been a driving instructor he really doesn't you know, have his feet on the ground with it. And I know one fellow who had been a driving instructor, he was hired. He was one of the unusual ones that was passing out of the thing that my said. Uh, the result is that he's regulated by people who really don't understand what, what you're doing. And they have no understanding of your problem until you tell them about it. And then they sit back and say, what the regulations say, and they keep going back to the regulations, and then it just relies on They can't change it. Yeah. So there's one job that you could get that would stop all that for you. Yeah. Right, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> being so, being, uh, with my political orientation, that's an impossibility. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, number seven, a, a, uh, 
part A, they tell you that uh, naturally they're not trying to prevent you from going to the test area with a sign on your car. It's not illegal to sit down in the car. And that may sound kind of obvious to you, but I know that driving school owners call me up and say, hey, Joe, can I go down there with those new regulations? Can I have a sign on top of the car? Uh, but somebody told me that I can't. In fact, I've even seen inspectors uh, do something like that. Yeah, I've even seen inspectors tell them, uh, I was down there once and we had an inspector who said uh, uh, you can't take the test unless you do have a sign on the car. This is a whole new switch to it. <laughs> and, you know, so, yeah, what's going on here? You know, since when? The regulation. You show me where it says in the regulation. You know, I argued the point and the instructor would be a patient, naturally. Uh, and, you know, and, uh, it turns out that the regulations don't say you need a sign on the car. They're just saying you may have a sign on the car when you go for the test. In fact, you need no signs on the top when you test. Those answers about what you need there. They're just saying what you may have. Uh, B, the director reserves the right to exclude uniform advertising used by a driver's school. That's the way they put it. The agreement, and they tell you now very carefully that a person shall not be given lessons, lectures, tutoring and so on and so forth, unless and until a written contract or form approved by the director uh, contains that information that outlines the instructions I will recommend maintain and execute a vote by the student and you. In other words, suppose you went out there to a student and you said, okay, I'm going to give you a lesson, you know. We're going to start out with the lesson, you sit behind the wheel, so on and so forth, let's go. As soon as you move that car, you violated the regulation. At that point, what you're supposed to do is say, now, if you haven't signed the enrollment form or the contract, whatever you call it, we must sign this to satisfy the requirements of the division over here. So please sign it. I'll even read the sections of it to you so that you know what it's about. And then they tell you one a common copy of such contract must be given to the student and the original thereof must be obtained by the school and the student the contract file. What's the business of the contract file? The copy of the contract. So they said you must be the same copy of every record of the, the original one you get. So that's an original contract file. Well, we've been through that with them before, and I tell you, I don't mind admitting that all of us are so proud of us. Some schools are keeping the copy. Some are keeping the original copy. Some are keeping the original copy. Some, some are giving them the original, you know, it's a mix of Some are keeping the original. I think in our school, we keep the. I think we keep the original. I don't know, they get fouled up every so often. I walk in and say, what are you keeping, the original or the copy? Oh, no, you know, they don't know what to say. I take a look and find out. And it's either one or the other. It's been changed, you know, because somebody looks at the other way. And somebody gets another part and say, hey, that's the same. These are, you know, fully edited. And yet they're better than others. Uh, a license may not be any contract unless and until the form of such contract has been approved by the director. Now you can tell you that you can't make up these contracts and say, here it is, now I'll let you sign. The director must be the or his representative, namely the chief inspector, that you look at it and say, okay, you can use it. And then go ahead and use it. Each school and maintain, uh, must file and maintain with the director a list of those persons organized or empowered to execute contracts on behalf of the school. A complete signature record form must be filed with the director. Hey, yes, so it's not every year. You have to renew it every year. Uh, if you're the owner of the school, you're the only one who probably will be empowered to sign a contract. Or your wife, or your husband, or some relative, or some very trusted employee. Uh, in my organization, we move to the point where uh, there are other people in addition to my wife who can sign the contract. Uh, we have actually, there are four of us in the organization who have the power to sign. But again, it's on file with the state. At one time, we had as many as six people who were authorized to sign it. And I had a two-man service at night, one for the day, one for the afternoon, and evening. Uh, four, this is an interesting one. It's interesting because it, it makes you scratch your head and wonder about, you know, what you should be telling the student when you go to work with them. 
at various stages along the way. A school shall not agree to give unlimited lessons. And notice that. A school shall not agree to give unlimited lessons. And yet, uh, I don't think you really have the right to tell somebody, I refuse to give you lessons. You know what I mean? You're at a point where the person says, well, I want more lessons. Well, then you almost have to go on with them to a point. But the next phrase maybe clarifies what they're getting at. I don't know. Uh, I've never understood that phrase about a school to not agree to one another. But nor shall any school represent or agree, orally or in writing, or as part of an inducement to sign any contract or to enroll business, to give instruction until the license is obtained, or to give free lessons, or a premium or a discount if a license is not obtained. And you'd be surprised how many people will call you up and say, you know, look, I've already had about 20 lessons with you. I've failed the test twice already. I think I'm entitled to some kind of a discount. They'll do it. I'm a good customer of yours, and so on and so forth. And, and you know, if you don't do that, I'm going to quit. I'll go to another school. And they don't believe me when I tell them. You know, I don't know that I feel any differently in their shoes. And I tell them, I can't do it. It's not what I want to do, but I just can't, even if I wanted to. I can't give you a discount. And, uh, you know, I've lost customers that way, and then in other cases they sort of hung up. But remember, if you're in the business, you don't have to look the authority to give a discount, especially with, just with the intent of keeping someone off, trying to keep taking lessons, you know, that sort of thing, and, and making them feel that you know, you just keep taking lessons and you're going to pay up the man and you're expecting to stay with us, you know, that sort of thing. Did the yeah. inspectors tell you as a school owner uh, what uh, the students have failed on? Yes. They, they give you the uh, information? They generally use the students to sort of tell them what they got uh, wrong on the fact. However, the slip does not contain all of the anecdotal notes the inspector had in his mind. My suggestion for you is that if you possibly can get all the inspectors, it's not too stressful time. So if it's just a day where you've got a backlog of students, don't bother. But if it's another day where, you know, he's not rushed, he comes back and the students fail, then you just add, you know, could you tell me quickly what it was about the students, you know? And I've had inspectors get very huffy with me on that, too. And I say, you know, I'm not trying to pin your ears back. I'm not trying to give you a hard time. I'm trying to improve myself as an instructor. I want to help. What should I not do to help this student to pass the test? If it's something that I missed up on, I just don't ask it. You know, and then the guy says, "Well, then he tells me what it is." If he beats me, he doesn't say, "Well, you should know you're an expert." Ha ha ha! You know, and walk away. He might act that way. It depends on the inspector. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, if you ever go down there, you know, <laughs> wait till they get your hooks on you. Okay. You get all kinds of inspections, but I tell you, that's why the inspectors are diminishing in number, I guess, because they've gotten a little bit too big for their britches at times. Another thing, the term number five, the term no refund is not permitted in contract. Schools may substitute the fall. This school will not refund any tuition or part of if the school is ready, willing, and able to fulfill its part of the agreement. Now that's changed a little bit because my contracts are made out with the old phrase that they had. I said this school will not be on any tuition or part of tuition. It is ready, willing, and able uh, to serve. You know. uh, they haven't told me to take the phrase out of there. They've seen it that way. And they seem to feel it's all right. Uh, again, they're saying in May. Uh, at the time that I put this out, I, uh, when I went by the original regulations, I think you had to have it in there at the time. They didn't say you may, you must have it. And now they're saying you may do this, and you can just leave the phrase out if you wish to. But you can't just say no refunds. If you're going to choose not to get refunds for students canceling, then you should tell them this way. And that's the way we put it. Is that a school as though the student is in May? No. It's assuming that uh, uh, a student is going to say to you, uh, oh, uh, by the way, I have a lesson in 10 minutes, and I decided I'm not going to the lesson. And then, uh, you know, I had 
national students to play for you in Florida. Uh, I didn't like it, but I felt I had to because of their attitude. Because again, your reputation is your business. If your reputation is that you're a sore cut, they're going to take every time you're going to go out there, they're going to take your instructions from the law. Who are the other 14 months? What? Who are the other 14 months? No, it's not a matter of principle. But in those days, we don't support plain school. In those days, I was still a proprietor, by the way. And it was very easy to support plain school. The corporation took it to the next But it pays, again, when you're thinking of the long range objectives of your business. Because if you're going to have a, if you're going to have a book full of lessons and half of a can to other people, you're in trouble. You've got men who want to be paid, and rightfully so. You're not going to have the money coming into the public bank. Uh, I wouldn't advocate a hard line, but I'd say that you should uh, make the students aware that they don't have the right to pay for that in the public bank. And if they do, they have to pay. In those days, practice driving was prohibited on roadways used to take driving tests. The drugs is much more secure than students have to You know, I have to get the time that I, I made a real boogie. Because I was bringing in one of my instructors, and the man, uh, he already had his experience instructors over the head first. I'll go out and take over his boots, and I'll say, Let me see your instructor, your uh, learning instructor. Why? What do you mean, why? I have to be your learning instructor. I have to be sure that you have in your possession in order to conduct a legal work. Well, the other guy I never asked for, he crossed me. You know, this sort of thing. And there was the one that argued with me last night, and I argued with me for the argument. I said, Look, man, I will not give you this lesson. I'm not going to show you what I want to say. You'll have to get out of the car and walk into the hospital. Oh, look. Uh, then she finally admitted, of course, I don't have it. I left it in, left it in New York. Well, that's great. You know, so you don't have a lesson. That's it. And it turns out she had left it there before. The man hadn't seen it, and he didn't have it. The, uh, if you're out there giving a student a lesson, they don't have credentials, you'll be told. If you allow someone to drive without a permit in their possession, a valid permit, that's another mistake. They're looking for your permit. They're only okay. They're going to look at the date of expiration. A valid permit in their possession. And something happens, you've got a real problem. All you have to do is get into an accident at that point. And you look like a jerk from the word go if they start investing in and they stop trying to prove that you were negligent and you were not quite the confident expert you should be. Or you should have been that with that particular student. Uh, so make sure they've got to learn a submit and make sure that you must have it in possession. You're responsible to see that they've done it. <coughs> then the requirements of the driving test, uh, that's part five of page 14. Uh, they'll tell you that you must have your identification certificate with you and uh, that you must have your instructor's license. Uh, let me put it this way. What are the, I think it's five things, what are the five items you should have with you when you go to a road test with a student? What are five things you have to have the license of the instructor, what else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your driver's license, what else? Registration of the vehicle, the ID certificate, what else? The student's learning permit, there you go. Those are the five items. Five things you must have in your possession when you appear with the students in the testing. Now, now we go to the employees of the driver school, part uh, six on page 14. The driver school shall not knowingly employ any person as an instructor or any other capacity, whatever, who has been convicted of a felony or a crime. And so now, even when I hire a girl as secretary, I have to ask her, do you have criminal records? All right, if I don't do that, then I'm guilty of violating their rules and regulations. 
So again, we're driving to along with the time point and the number. The time point, and that's one of them. Uh, the school may appoint the school with the director or the organization. Uh, this is somebody who will just take somebody to a test. They're not eligible to teach. Uh, they have put down that the applicant must be a moral, good moral character, whatever that means in terms of the law. Basically, they wouldn't have a criminal record. That's all they can mean by that. Uh, must be at least 18 years of age. Uh, must hold a valid New Jersey driver's license. Now, if you hire somebody that's about 18 years of age, you better watch out. Because your insurance company had better know that you have people that young operating your vehicle. I know that my insurance company, uh, they know that we have nobody under 25 years of age except where the car is used for family use. My daughter drives it, and that's it. And again, it's the food, and you know, they've made a course there where it means the only teenage driver that drives the car uh, on the behalf of the school and the state of the person reading on the business. So watch out for that one. If you uh, hire people that young, then make sure that uh, your insurance company has it got something to find for them that works against you in the next As does the person must hold a valid New Jersey driver's license and must have a satisfactory driving record and must complete an application on the form supplied by the Jersey Motor Vehicle. Where do you get the form from the driving school on which plan to hire you? And again, three passport type photos and the state police and the FBI can be and they'll tell you that there's no charge for this certificate, uh, and uh, the shall stay on until it's time to revoke. And uh, they'll say when you accept employment, the school owner is to collect the authorized data and identification file and send it to the office. And again, you know, people behave very funny, very foolishly, you know, when you ask for their credentials. You ask a man to give you a construction license, you ask somebody to drop it, maybe give you an agency if you have to send it in. And you know, they act like uh, more, you know, and it's not there. It's only there that they're working for it. You have to send it in. And what you want to do is what the state says you must do. And then, and then for him to renew it, he's got to put down $15 from another school? And let's say he's leaving your school to go to another school? No, that's okay. He's going to work the so what school. The state takes care of that and puts him in the board. Uh, they can get a resort where they can transfer over to the school to one dollar. But well, what does he have as an instructor to prove he that he is an instructor? He has nothing to prove that he is an instructor. Well, how does he go for another appointment and say, I am an instructor, I have nothing to prove it? He's filing well, the application. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's filing another application. He's filing another application. <laughs> but uh, no, actually, uh, uh, if you if you need, say you're working from high school and you want to go to another school, it's as easy as me sending your instructor's license and saying this man no longer works here. I'm not the new but I'm in trouble. And you going to the other driving school and filing an application for renewal through him, uh, that instructor file for his school. And then Trenton sends back a new instructor file with the address of that school on it that you're employed. But if you keep your license, then uh, they can deny you or they can deny you this. Because, you know, especially let's say you tell me I refuse to let you have that. And I, you know, then I write in and I say, the man is no longer employed by me. He refused to turn in the license that he was required for. And that's why I could not send it to you. I've got to say, though, they're going to come after me. And then they might say to you, why didn't they might ask you first, why didn't you hand it in? The chances are they may be lenient with you. Or they may say, uh, don't you know you're supposed to hand it in? And then you say, yes, but or, you know, they don't like your answer anyway. It's not what you tell them. They don't have to renew it. They can say you violated the regulation if you didn't hand it in. Uh, uh, one more question. Yeah. Uh, there he is. Of course, he goes to another state. He went to. He has nothing to prove that he was an instructor. He doesn't need anything to prove. They write to the school. Now, when you work with a school for years, you have a long instructor's license. You don't need that. 
I think so. Well, I mean, the other day, in other words, when you renew your license every year, you've got your own license in your pocket. I've got the license from two to three years in my pocket. Uh, if you want something to prove that you want to you can use that. Uh, you're saying that
to figure them what's not really driven that much. And you know, people want to fail for their own sake. But I don't get yourself involved in tampering with his decision. No matter how good you think your student looks, if you're still back to you do try to find out what it was that he was bothered by him. I said, well, she looks like he knows who he was. But uh, the right turns are too wide. They're too sharp. The person pulled away from the curve, boy, they never looked. They didn't check traffic yet. They both the brake on the turn. Again, you can't see that. They can make a nice smooth turn, and you might not see the foot on the brake pedal. You don't see the tail like the car coming towards you. Okay, they go into the grounds for relocation and suspension and refusal to renew, which I won't go into. Uh, that speaks for itself. And it's stated right in Title 39, it is for Title 39. Our uh, instructors drive the school, part three on page 16, license is required and they tell you. Uh, that you must have an instructor's license issued by the director. They point out that Bound for any only in connection with the business of the driver school or schools listed thereon. They don't tell you that you teach in more than one school. But if it's only listed for one school, you can't teach in another school until the state says you can, until they approve the idea. Uh, and they tell you that you must have a license for at least three years. And you'll comply with other requirements and things in great place. And they tell you that your application uh, should be on the form prescribed by the director, which you get from the driving school owner. Your renewal application should be submitted for approval at least 10 days prior to the expiration date of the current license. That's a new one. They didn't put it like that before. That's a new one. The director will issue an instructor's license to the applicant upon approval of admission or renewal application thereof. I'll tell you about the Photographs, they want three photographs, the fingerprinting is required, and uh, they'll tell you that you must be at least 21 years of age to get your original instructor's license. Uh, the fee for an instructor's license will tell you for $15 fee, and they'll tell you you must carry the instructor's license at all times while getting driver's license, or when accompanying an applicant for driver's test to the driver's test line and motor vehicle motorcycle. Should your license be lost, mutilated, or destroyed, a duplicate license will be issued upon proof of the fact that payment will be at one dollar in case of mutilated license. Uh, you should surrender the license. And the proof of the fact shall be the date the license was lost, mutilated, or destroyed, the circumstances involving such loss, mutilation, or destruction. And six, surrender of destructive license. When you need to wear a that destructive license must be surrendered to the provision of motor vehicles immediately upon. Termination of an instructor services with or by any driving school designated on such license. So there it is. And they change that a little bit. They don't say that the school has to send it in. They just say it must be turned in. So in other words, if you tell your boss, I quit, and he asks the instructor license, and you say, no, I'm turning it in myself, and you can turn it in. So you have to turn it on, I don't know saying, he didn't turn it in, he said he's turning it in himself. Uh, talking about circumstances involving loss, mutilation, or destruction, I had one man lose an instructor's license. And I'll tell you about this story, uh, and I'll tell you this because I feel it may help you to avoid such loss and loss. When you give your credentials to the inspector, he usually keeps everything with him. Yeah. That's basically your registration of the car, students' permit, your driver's license, and the instructor's license. He keeps everything with him, or he tries to. And of course, ever since then, I've had a darn good case for getting my papers back right away. I said, you know, let me have my instructor's license back, please, and my driver's license. And I put it just like that. I don't miss any words with my course, the first thing. And, uh, you know, sometimes they argue, and I tell them, I want my credentials, please. I like them, I'm proud of them. I get them back. Uh, I don't argue with them much, but when it comes to something like that, I stand my ground. This man, it was his first motorcycle. He picked a new instructor, the first motorcycle. He was afraid of the inspector. The inspector said, Yeah, I'll give everything away. I'll, I'll go on to the stuff. He shoved everything on the, on the ledge of the task force. They were out on the ground at this time of the year. He comes back from the road test. He opens the door. 
Wind blows little paper through up. The registration was found, so there was a little bit of hard work to pick that up. And the truck was licensed only as long as you keep the paper. And that's blue, 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 I had to take him and send him right down the trench to get him to the truck department. So, don't you know that I was called to know in certain terms that man moved the car without that license with a low key tool license? Today, what? And I go, I'll tell you one thing from now on. Don't you dare have any threat to take my license or any man's license and keep it. Because if you do, then I'm going to make noise over it. And so, as I say, I go down there. I don't think any words with I want my papers back. And I told him, look, you get your papers back. Don't let that man ride around with your instructor's license and your driver's license. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have a right to. He was just a point of fact. All right, so if you're a new man, you might get discouraged, you know. But uh, again, I tell you this because if you let him ride around with your credential, make sure the first thing that you're watching for him when he gets back. And uh, another thing I might have to do. Our inspector recently came along and took all the credentials. He did all for the students. Me. All right, the student ended up going home with my, from one of my cars, the, uh, the identification certificate, the registration, the instructor's license, thanks to this inspector. And thanks to this instructor who was afraid of the inspector, he was afraid of the you know. So, if they're lost under those circumstances, here's your main point to say, my instructor's license was lost because the inspector, he put it down, you know, this, 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 that, 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 that. Because a lot of uh, pain, a lot of things you have to do to see what you're doing, you know. You either ride back down the trench and you have to write to them and that sort of thing. So I'll show them some thoughts. The surrender of the instructor's license, don't forget, you do have to surrender to confirm the employment. If you're driving in Kelowna, you must tell the man or woman to give me their instructor's license. <coughs> uh, Special test required to tell you about the test of the instructor is being able to take uh, the character of the applicant to our city and to tell you, uh, again, the instructor's license is not the issue for any person who is not a good character. There are those who are just the same as the instructor. The topic of instructor is that the teacher is the subject of the professional and personal matters. We're going to have a lot of practice on that. With employees of the grid motor vehicles, they tell you something basically uh, with regard to the uh, other types of security or the person who is in the contract and the person who is in the contract. They tell you about the grounds of relocation and the kind of thing. They make it very vague uh, words. The director or any employee of the grid motor vehicles have been found by him and his friend or both. Instructor license or excuse with the rule here or any of the reasons I'm on the task of Title 39. Uh, they write a statute, so for failure to comply with any regulations promulgated by the director and the student notice in line, they are supposed to consider the performance in the Page 19, classroom facility. If you're going to open the driving school, you must have a classroom facility that you're going to use. Uh, they'll tell you here that you know, if you need a certain space, you should have a minimum of six hours of instruction. Offering to students and those of any commercial school. The classroom facility of each driving school may not be more than 15 miles from the principal place of business or the parents of the school. And whatever that means, it's kind of tricky, but uh, it means that you would have, uh, I guess, the public people like Baggett Fleet Operations or Thai Operations, too, so you have them running inside the classroom. Again, there are different uh, ways that this can be, you know, I guess, stressed. Uh, you're handling uh, classrooms that have also been taking courses throughout the state, for example, Texas has a classroom facility, and every high school that your school is teaching in connection with you know, that happens. Theoretically, you're supposed to be offering classrooms and instruction all the time, concurrently with your actual driving school operation. In reality, this is a problem. You can't do it. People call you up, and so you might get one person who says, oh, I want to take class. Yeah, all right, you're going to go and get class to one person. Uh, and, you know, they just, they just don't. <coughs> and uh, anyway, you really don't get to do that. Uh, most of the time, when we run into it, we send out our literature comments and classroom instruction is also available. And the reason for that is to put our feet down and uh, fail to 
Would the classroom instruction be less than the normal fee of driving on the road? Because if you're going to have a group and you together, you want to be different? Yeah, we, we also have a usually hire for that we get about 40 or something. We've got a to change. I think it's roughly about $20 in each charge for the question, which is about $6 a question. What people can buy at the office, they sell. Well, wouldn't it be hard to even get the group together? Yes, this is the other problem that we have where, you know, how do they get to the school? Do you go and get them to bring them one? That's right. Uh, again, uh, we find that the adult education program is no problem. They get there. And so if they were compelled, if they were compelled to take the classroom instruction with a commercial school, the chances are they find a way to get there. But they're not compelled to do it, but it will fix it. Even the adult education question, you know, I think people will call up and they say, do I really have to take the question? And the answer is, you really don't want to know, but you should because it's good. It helps you to know uh, more of what to do when you get out on the road. So I can't, I don't want to, I just, you know, I just want to say what's behind you as well. If that's your wish, you go ahead. But you don't get a discount because of that. You pay the whole thing. You need to not take questions if you're just a The adult education question. Yeah. They are contracting with the Board of Education, not with your school. No. You contract with the Board of Education. No, they contract with us. And we have in the, in the classroom, they all sit there, and the first thing we do is our first order of business is to follow the regulations that everybody's on the contract. And they pay you directly? No, they pay the Board of Education. That's the point of the question. That's the only point that they, they hold with the Board. They pay the Board of Education. The Board of Education is paying you the Board, right? That's the We get that. Uh, you know, sometime later. Something to think about if you do adults for work. You've got to watch that you have enough capital to work with. Because you won't get that much back for a while. You got to grab a pay salary and come up. But with no money to come in for it. Okay. Facilities may change for classroom instruction may be used by one or more driver schools. In other words, two schools got together and said, hey, let's, uh, let's both use the classroom. So we'll ship them together and make a deal according to that. Again, that's approved. Uh, the classroom accommodations, I'll tell you that the subject of inspection approved by the director must have the following. City facilities providing services for no less than 10 students. Adequate lighting, heat, and ventilation in separate sanitary facilities for both men and women. Adequate shock and diagrams of pictures relating to the operation of motor vehicles and traffic loads. Adequate blackboards that are visible from all the seating areas. Uh, textbooks, reference books, and pamphlets relating to the proper operation of motor vehicles and traffic loads. Classroom equipment. Each classroom must be equipped with sound protection of flight projectors and slides. In addition to the floor line, the classroom is much the same as the floor following the window. Now, if there's any two of these, reaction time testing device, depth perception testing device, peripheral vision testing device, magnetic traffic board. Uh, such other devices will, as well as you guys, such other devices, which will help students to acquaint themselves with traffic laws and prepare them for safety operations. Okay, so, uh, Somewhat through the equipment. Now I'll bring up some of the equipment that I told you in the past. 